All right, welcome to Love and Money Secrets TV, and today we are going to be reviewing chapter two of Becoming Supernatural, and I'm so happy and excited because we have Jennifer Crone with us, and she's going to be starting this off because we are in this special Stargate time period where it's scientifically proven. We actually had Dr. Bruce Lipton, actually he went on a broadcast earlier today and announced, you know, there's a group of scientists all over the world. They identified that there's a big um, energy opening right now as we are broadcasting this right now. So we are called to go into meditation, increase, you know, our heart, love, joy, and compassion. So this is a perfect time for us to be doing this right now and for us to do it at 11 a.m., 11 p.m. for the next 48 hours. So I'll put the YouTube link if you guys would like here in the chat um, before the broadcast is over. Jennifer, would you go ahead and get started then? I want everybody to start with, with some deep breaths and we will listen to the um, music uh, singing bowls and that will get us into the state. And then Spirit will inform me as to when to begin uh, the reading of chapter two. Wonderfully, it's called the present moment. Wouldn't you believe it? So perfect, yes. So perfect, yes it is.
Let us begin. Chapter two, the present moment. If you want to experience the supernatural in your own life by healing your body, creating new opportunities you could never have imagined before, and having transcendent mystical experiences, you first need to master the concept of the present moment, the eternal now. There's a lot of talk about being present or being in the now these days. While most people understand the basic, basics of what that means, not to think about the future or live in the past, I want to offer you a completely different understanding of the concept. It's going to require that you get beyond the physical world, including your body, your identity, and your environment, and even beyond yourself. This is where you turn possibility into reality. After all, if you don't get beyond who you think you are and the way you've been conditioned to believe the world is and works, it's not possible to create a new life or a new destiny. So in a really very real sense, you have to get out of your own way and transcend the memory of yourself as an identity and allow something greater than you, something mystical to take over. In this chapter, I'm going to explain how that works. First, let's take a look at how the brain functions and when any neurological issue in the brain or the body is activated, it creates mind. Consequently, from a neuroscientific understanding, mind is the brain in action. So for instance, you have a specific mind to drive your car. You have another mind to take a shower. You have a different mind when you sing a song or listen to music. You use a specific level of mind to execute each of those complex functions because you've probably done each of these tasks thousands of times. So your brain turns on in a very specific way whenever you do any of them. When your brain is in action as you drive your car, for example, you are in fact turning on a specific sequence, pattern, and combination of neurological networks. Those neural networks or neural nets are simply clusters of neurons that work together as a community. Just like an automatic software program or a macro because you've done that particular action so many times. In other words, the neurons that fire together to accomplish the task become more wired together. So as you consciously choose to perform the task of driving your vehicle, we could say that you are automatically selecting and instructing those neurons in your brain to turn on to create a level of mind. So for the most part, your brain is a product of the past and it has been shaped and molded to become a living record of everything you have learned and experienced up to this point in your life. Learning from a neuroscientific standpoint is when your neurons in your brain assemble to form thousands of synaptic connections. And those connections then assemble into complex three-dimensional neurological networks. Think of learning as your brain getting an upgrade. When you pay attention to knowledge or information and it makes sense to you, this interaction with the environment leaves a biological impression in your brain. When you experience something new, your senses write the story neurologically in your brain and even more neurons come together to make even more enriched connections, upgrading your brain even further. Okay, I wanna stop right here right now because one of the things that Dr. Joe Dispenza shares with us when we have been in the monastery and his advanced training is that there is a researcher named Candell who discovered that whenever you re you learn something new, you hear something for the first time, that you have up to 2,600 neurons and neuro neurological pathways of the brain that are created when normally when you do things that are on rote that you have repeatedly done over and over again, you only have 1,300 neurological pathways of the brain that are actually firing and wiring to affect the habits, the things that you're conditioned to doing all the time. So by your just hearing this information, for example, for the first time, for your having listened and heard Jennifer Crone play the uh, singing bowls at the beginning of this broadcast, that 
first time experience automatically creates a situation where now your brain has 2,600 neurological pathways of the brains and neurons that are firing and wiring because it's learning and integrating something new. So in, an, in essence, you are giving your brain a workout every time you learn something new. Um, Jennifer, I want to give you the opportunity if there's something that you want to add to this or any personal experience that uh, would maybe add to this, I want to give you opportunity to also chime in. Thank you. And you know, you know what I started doing after my week long was um, brushing my teeth and eating with my, my non dominant hand. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And that really sort of wakes up the brain and gets out of the routine of the same thing and creates new neural pathways as well. You know, that's, that's, you know, it's amazing how you and I are so connected because probably about a week ago, um, I heard Donda Pandey, who is a um, Tibetan monk who is a, a high priest and he teaches, you know, his uh, advanced teachings as well. And one of the things that he suggests is that you do exactly that is to oh, use that. your non-dominant hand to begin to brush your teeth every morning for the next 30 days so that you start to use different parts of your brain. And so I just started doing that not even quite about, I think five days ago. And it's um, unusual in the morning because you're, you know, it's a, it's a different feeling than your dominant hand. Mm -hmm. And I remember the second, the first two mornings I remembered right away. The third morning, I remember I went to grab it with my right hand. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be doing this with my left hand. And um, for some reason, it seemed even more unfamiliar that third day than it did the first or second day. And I know that that's just frame of mind. You know, it's probably because I held it first in my right hand. So now I had the contrast of having done it with my right versus my left hand. And, um, and so I just, I just keep on doing it every day. And then I noticed how my hand not only feels different, but even the pressure on my teeth as I brush all the inside of my mouth, I notice that it feels different. Mm -hmm. But it is, um, you know, doing things like that. Another thing that Don Pandi also recommends, in addition to brushing your teeth uh, every morning with your non-dominant hand for the next 30 days, he talked a little bit about the Zygardnik effect, which has to do the cycles of completion when you begin something that in your brain, you actually have parts of your brain on the subconscious level that knows that you haven't finished that task. So the number of tasks that you have that aren't completed deplete energy from you. And so if you want to empower yourself and take back some of your power and um, clean that up, you need to close some of those open loops. So one of the first thing he tells people to do when people first start to, you know, get coached by him and trained and um, are taught by him, first thing he tells you to do is start brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand. And he tells you, if you haven't been making your bed every morning, Start making your bed every morning as soon as you get out of bed. Why? Because that signals the completion of the cycle of sleep. You now are telling your body, I'm done sleeping. I'm now wide awake. I'm now going to make my bed. That completes that cycle of action of that portion of the day that involves sleep. And it won't be until the end of the day then, that you then come back and then you open that new cycle. And he said, the, you know, you can't start closing all the loops of open loop cycles that you have all at a time. But as you become aware of different things that you have that are cycles of action that are not complete, you can begin to close those and you'll find that you have more energy. That makes total sense. Yeah. I'm curious, where did you learn or where did you get the idea to brush your teeth with, with your non-dominant hand? I think I saw it in um, a YouTube video. Some guy, probably some promo for like a Mind Valley masterclass or something. 
And um, it just made total sense to me. And so I started doing it in June and I noticed that it took me like twice as long to brush my teeth because my hand was like sloppy. Mm -hmm. But now I've been doing it since then and it's now second nature to, to use my left hand. And so I'm like, okay, well, I wonder if now my brain is used to that. And so it's not as effective anymore. No, so it's still effective. Is the thing is, it's now it has become, that's your new familiar. Right. This yeah. Is, is exactly what Dr. Joe is trying to tell us. You know, yes, when we first start to do these meditative practices for people who've never meditated before or who have never meditated in this way before, at first it's unfamiliar. And then the more you do it, as you master the, I'm going to call it lower levels because you have the beginning, you know, you have before you go to any of his advanced training, you have that meditative practice. Then you go to his advanced training and then you have more specific advanced practice that builds on what you learn from the books and from the online progressive and the, um, you know, the extensive uh, week long that he has also online. And so once you get to a live advanced training, you have to have been familiar with that so that now you can incorporate the breath and all the other elements of the formula. And then of course, from that stage, once you become familiar with that and start to have, you know, you, you start to feel, sense, have things happen. And, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where it's a lifelong progress. It's going to continue to build moving forward forever now so, yeah totally. so it's, I started doing i just remembered that i wanted to eat with my non-dominant hand too and so i just started doing that and it it takes a lot longer to eat as well but i think that's for the best yeah i you know and it's like everything in life you know some you know i happen to be ambidextrous so it's funny because for me to eat, you know, right or left-handed doesn't make a difference. I always eat with my non-dominant hand um, just as a habit because I was, you know, my mother kind of tried, you know, there's the, it, we were always, it was brought to our attention that, you know, there's the American way of holding your fork and knife and then there's the European way of holding your fork and knife. And so we were always trained in the European form uh, of holding our fork and knife but um, I have two younger brothers. So two out of the three of us, we happen to be ambidextrous, like my mother, who's ambidextrous. She can read, she can write and, and do all sorts of things with both left, right hand equally as well. So when it comes to eating, for me to hold my fork on my right or my left doesn't make a difference. Interestingly enough, it was so foreign though, to brush my teeth with my left hand was very awkward, very clumsy and much, much slower, even though I'm ambidextrous, go figure. Yeah. So, but that's one thing everybody can begin to do starting tonight before you go to sleep, brush, brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand. And that will start to now engage instead of 1300 neurons that are firing and wiring and syncing and, and linking together, you'll have 2600, it'll be awake right now going, whoa, whoa, whoa she's doing something different. Oh my gosh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, she, we can't just go to sleep and just use 1300, you know, neurological pathways of the brain. We got to use 2600. We got to double up the forces because she's doing something unfamiliar. And so now you're brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand. So I think it's a great little thing that anybody, no matter where they're at, they can employ today. Yeah, I agree. So, okay, moving on here. Chapter two, experiences not only enhance the brain circuitry, like we just mentioned, but they also create emotions. And I just pause here because Jennifer and I were just sharing how, you know, the emotions and the feelings and the thoughts that we had just by beginning to do something really you would think is trivial, but it's really not that trivial if you think about it. If you have 2,600, you know, neurological pathways of the brain that are firing and wiring, that's really that's a significant brain event. So I like the fact that it also creates emotions simultaneously. 
So think of emotions as the chemical residue from past experiences or chemical feedback. The stronger the emotional quotient from an event in your life, the more experience leaves a lasting impression in your brain. And that's how long-term memories are formed. So if learning means making new connections in your brain, memories are when you maintain those connections. The more you repeat a thought, choice, behavior, experience, or emotion, the more those neurons fire and wire together and the more they will sustain a long-term relationship. So in Anna's story, which we learned about in chapter one, you learn most of your experiences come from your interaction with your external environment. And since your senses plug you into the external environment and neurologically record the narrative in your brain, when you experience a highly charged emotional event, bad or good, that moment becomes embossed neurologically in your brain as a memory. Therefore, when an experience changes how you normally feel chemically and heightens your attention, it heightens your attention to what caused it, you will associate a specific person or a thing with where your body is at a particular time and place. And that's how you create memories by interacting with the outer world. It's safe to say that the only place the past actually exists is in your brain and in your body. So I want to talk a little bit about this because when we are at Dr. Joe's seven day advanced uh, events where he creates a monastery and brings a, literally a thousand of us from over 60 different countries, not only does he give us specific interest, you know, instruction, not only does he demonstrate, not only does he give us all the scientific papers to back up the neurochemistry, neuroendocrinology, et cetera, um, all the physics behind it, the quantum physics, et cetera. Um, but he also creates opportunities for us to actually do this process, to do the meditations, to do the coherence healings. But he also creates an unexpected, unwanted, elevated emotion by subjecting us to a challenge course. And in that challenge course, you have fear, anxiety, nervousness, trepidation that is triggered in you because it's usually something that is some sort of challenge course that for me puts the fear of God in you. And so now, you know, I'm with an unwanted situation, you're having an emotion, but what he teaches you is that you don't have to keep reacting and embracing the thoughts on a broken record that is going to keep emotions that take and drain energy from you. Instead, you can go, wait a minute. Okay, no, this is not cool. I don't want this. I don't like this. Does it make sense that I'm going to even, how can I physically, it's like, doesn't seem like it's humanly possible for you to do, but if he's telling you to do it, it obviously is possible. So you hit the pause button. You're like, okay, this is what I was trained to do. I'm gonna slow down my heart rate. I'm gonna slow down my breath. I'm gonna slow down my brain waves. I'm gonna get myself into theta state. And I'm gonna take my awareness and my focus and with laser-like precision, I'm gonna focus on the goal, which at the first monastery I was at, we, it was a challenge course where there was a bright yellow eye beam that was 50 feet up in the air and you had to walk from one side to the other. So now you're converting that fear energy that this is impossible. Oh my gosh, the nerves are shaking the what all whatever reaction that you're having. You're going, okay, nope. I'm commanding my brain. My thoughts are going, this is impossible. Nope. This is possible. No. And ego, you're crazy. You can't do this. Nope you shut up, you can't, you're, you don't have any room here. It's like, this is not a voice that's helping me right now. So you shut up, brain, I'm the master, you're the servant. So brain, you do as I say, I need all of my energy and my entire body. I don't know how I'm gonna get to the other side, but I gotta get to the other side. So I need all of my energy to be like a laser. 
and I've got to take all of my focus of all my body. I need to have perfect balance as I steadily, surely, and steadily and safely get to the other side. And so at the end of the story, I have a video where I actually go through that entire experience and soup to nuts. So I'm not going to take the time to do that now. But what ended up happening is instead of that being a negative memory for me, I had 2,600 neurons firing and wiring and syncing together. So after I left the monastery, I can't tell you the number of events that I ended up experiencing where instead of me dredging up and being worried, freaked out, nervous, scared, yada, 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 I used that experience because the outcome was so positive and I still had those 2,600 neurons that were firing and wiring in my memory. I brought that back up and I said, you know what? I'm going to slow my heart rate down, slow down my breath. I'm going to slow down my brain waves. I'm going to get myself into theta. Any it's like, no, worry, fear, nervous, freak out, scared, all of that, off. Brain, shut up, do as I say. I don't have any, I'm not going to put any awareness, any focus, any attention. I don't want to, that's like a sieve that's losing gas out of a gas tank. Nope, I need all my energy. I have an emergency. I have a crisis. I have an unwanted situation. I need to get a grip. I needed to get into the zone. And so I used that memory to have me replicate a positive outcome. And I'll be darned, it worked every single time. And with each time that I would do it, it made me more excited and it increased my knowingness at a different level where it's like, I got this. Yes, this is the way we do this. Oh my gosh. You know, I don't want to have the results that 99% of the people do who are freaking out, you know, they're in work and panic and sorrow, sadness, um, all the negative emotions for hours, days, weeks on end. No, I immediately, seconds after I recognized the negative thoughts, feelings, and emotions, I got a grip and I applied what I learned back in the monastery. And I've been doing that ever since. And so it's my wish that everyone learns how to do this, how to master, not the outside. It's, this is not about mastering COVID, mastering economic potential duress. This is not about anything on the outside. This is about you, or in my case, as I sit in this jar and you're looking at my label, I have to master me. And mastering me involves me mastering my ego my brain and my body. There's three things I have to master, my ego, my brain, and my body, because my brain and my ego might pay attention. And what I learned when I was up in that challenge course was that I got a grip of my brain and my ego, and then my, my legs started shaking. And I'm going, wait a minute, I'm not afraid. I already got in the zone, but my body started, started to betray me. So then I had to command my brain, which is what controls my body, because, you know, my body is a record of all, of all the past thoughts, feelings, and emotion. So it's bringing up the fear of the past. So I said, brain, shut those legs down. I can't be wasting energy shaking legs. That's unacceptable. Do as I say, shut those legs down. Stop them from shaking. I need my legs to walk steadily. Can you imagine trying to walk over this I-beam and your legs are shaking? It's going to be a lot harder for you to balance yourself. So I'm like, no, I don't want that. I want my body to be completely at peace so that I can now steadily improve my odds that I'm going to succeed, right? But that's what we all, that's what the real work is, is mastering ourselves so that we're not fighting ourselves anymore. That's what it means when you hear people, we used to always go, what do they mean that they're fighting themselves? That's what it means. Because you have your brain, your ego, and your body that's fighting the true you that knows, that knows better, that has loving thoughts towards you, that knows that nothing is impossible. You know, I'm one with the one, I'm, I'm, I am the one, and if I put my mind to it, 
really, if I put my heart, mind and soul to it, I can do this because I'm not doing it by myself. I'm connecting with the divine in order to do it. So you're not alone. Does that make sense? Yes, beautifully said. So moving on here, the next section says how your past becomes your future. So let's take a closer look at what happens biochemically inside your body when you think a thought or feel an emotion. When you think a thought or have a memory, a biochemical reaction begins in your brain, causing the brain to release certain chemical signals. That's how immaterial thoughts literally become matter. They become chemical messengers. These chemical signals make your body feel exactly the way you were just thinking. Once you notice you were feeling a particular way, then you generate more thoughts equal to how you're feeling. And then you release more chemicals from your brain to make you feel the way you've been thinking. So for example, if you have a fearful thought, you start to feel fear. And the moment you feel fear, that emotion influences you to think more fearful thoughts. And those thoughts trigger the release of even more chemicals in the brain and body that make you continue to feel more fear. The next thing you know, you get caught in a loop where your thinking creates feeling and your feelings create thinking. So if thoughts are the vocabulary of the brain and feelings are the vocabulary of the body, and the cycle of how you think and feel becomes your state of being, then your entire state of being is in the past. So when you fire and wire the same circuits in your brain over and over again, because you keep thinking the same thoughts, you're hardwiring your brain into the same patterns. So as a result, your, your brain becomes an artifact of your past thinking. And in time, it becomes easier to automatically think in the same ways. So at the same time, as you repeatedly feel the same emotions over and over again, since, as I just said, emotions are the vocabulary of the body and the chemical residue of past experiences, you are conditioning your body into the past. So now let's look at what it means for you on a day-to-day -day basis, given what you just learned about feelings and emotions being the chemical and products of past events, the moment you wake up in the morning and search for the more familiar feeling called you, you're starting your day in the past. So when you start to think about your problems, those problems which are connected to the memories of the past and experiences of different people or things at certain times and places, create familiar feelings such as unhappiness, futility, sadness, pain, grief, anxiety, worry, frustration, unworthiness, or guilt. If those emotions are driving your thoughts and you cannot think greater than how you feel, then you are also thinking in the past. And if those familiar emotions influence the choices you are going to make that day, the behaviors you're going to exhibit or the experiences you are going to create for yourself, then you're going to appear predictable and your life is going to stay the same. Now, let's say after you wake up, you turn off your alarm and as you lie there in bed, you check your Facebook, your Instagram, your WhatsApp, your Twitter, your texts, your emails, and then the news. Now you are really remembering who you are as you reaffirm your personality and connect to your present, your past present personal reality. Then you go to the bathroom, you use a toilet, brush your teeth, take a shower, get dressed, and then head for the kitchen. You drink some coffee and eat breakfast. Maybe you watch the news or check your email again. It's the same routine you follow every day. Then you drive to work using the same old route. When you get there, you interact with the same coworkers that you saw the day before. You spend your day performing pretty much the same duties and, that you performed yesterday. You might even react to the same challenges at work with the same emotions. Then after work, you drive home. Maybe you stop at the grocery store and buy the food you always like to eat. You cook the same food for dinner and watch the same television show at the same time and while sitting in the same place in your living room. Then you get ready for bed in the same way you always do. You brush your teeth with your right hand, starting from the upper right side of your mouth. You crawl into the same side of the bed. Maybe you read a little, and then you go to sleep. If you keep doing these same routines over and over again, they will become a habit. A habit is a redundant set of autonomic, unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that you acquire through frequent repetition. So basically, it means your body is now on autopilot. 
running a series of programs and over time your body becomes the mind. You've done this routine so many times that your body automatically knows how to do certain things better than your brain or unconscious mind. So you switch on the autopilot and you go unconscious, which means you'll wake up the next morning and essentially do the same things all over again. In a very real sense, your body is dragging you into the same predictable future based on what you have been repeatedly doing in the same familiar past. You will think the same thoughts and then make the same choices that lead to the same behaviors, that create the same experience, that produce the same emotions. And over time, you created a set of hardwired neurological networks in the brain and you have emotionally conditioned your body to live in the past and that past becomes your future. So if you were looking at a timeline of your day, starting with waking up in the morning and continuing until you go to bed at night, you would pick up that timeline of yesterday or today, your past, and place it in the space reserved for tomorrow, the future, because essentially the same actions you took today are the ones you are going to take tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. So let's face it, if you keep the same routine as yesterday, it makes sense that your tomorrow is going to be a lot like yesterday. Your future is just a rerun of your past. That's because your yesterday is creating your tomorrow. So take a look and it tells you to look at figure 2.1. Each of those vertical lines represent the same thought that leads to the same, the same choice that initiates an automatic behavior that creates a known experience that produces a familiar feeling or an emotion. If you keep reproducing the same sequence in time, all those individual steps merge into one auto, automatic, automatic program. So the arrow represents an unknown experience, dropping in somewhere between your driving to work and traffic, knowing you are going to be late again, and you trying to stop by the dry cleaners on your way. We could say that your mind and body are in the known, the same predictable future based on what you did in the same familiar past. And in that known, certain future, there's no room for the unknown. In fact, if something new happened, if something unknown were to unfold in your life at the moment, at that moment to change the same predictable timeline of your day, you'd probably be annoyed at the disruption of your routine. You'd likely consider it troublesome, problematic, and downright inconvenient. So you might say, uh, can you come back tomorrow? This is not the right time. A habit is a redundant set of automatic, unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that develop through repetition. It's when you've done something so many times that your body is programmed to become the mind. And over time, your body is dragging you to a predictable future based on what you've been doing in the past. Therefore, if you're not in the present moment, you're probably in a program. So the fact is there's no room for the unknown in a predictable life. Let's stop right there. I love this because I think if we don't stop here, a lot of people are gonna miss this huge point. A lot of people want their lives to improve for the better, but they wanna to cling to things always being the same. So you gotta make up your mind. Either you make room for the unexpected or the unpredictable, or you don't. You get to either argue for your limitations and change nothing, keep everything the same as they are, even though you might be miserable, or you have to be open to the unpredictable. You have to be open to the unexpected. Do you have something to say? I kind of have a feeling you have something to say about that, uh, Jennifer. Just that <clears throat> it's interesting because people have been talking so much around this time about how important it is to keep a routine. Mm -hmm. And I always say in my head, like routine lulls the brain to sleep, which I've heard Dr. Joe say so many times. Mm -hmm. 
but I think that it's important. But then like people like us who do the work meditate every single day, usually Mm -hmm. like right when we wake up. And so I've thought about like, well, is that a routine? And so I don't think all routines are bad. And I think ritual is important as well like certain the certain things we do every day, I just think it's important to know what they are and if the things we're doing every day are bringing us closer to our future selves that we want to become. That we're creating, yes. Or, you know, like I definitely think first thing in the morning, checking your phone is the worst thing you can do. Mm-hmm. The first thing I do when I wake up is like, is consciously love my body and recite my affirmations in my head before I even open my eyes Mm -hmm. and change my state right away. Yeah. And so like, that's a routine, yes, but that's a routine that's helping. Yeah, it's feeding positive back into your body to, to pave the day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and even, well, For example, you know, there are certain routines that are absolutely, you know, routines and rituals that are absolutely necessary, like waking up in the morning, like brushing your teeth um, every morning, like eating. But something like you said about meditation. Yeah, we meditate every day, multiple times a day, but we don't have a ritual or a routine in the meditation where our expectation is that each meditation is going to create, has this particular outcome we have built into the meditations where we do expect the unexpected because we know that we have to have the act. We have to, we do have to let go and we have to surrender. There's a part you come with an intention in your meditation. And, you know, of course this is after you have set your heart, you have heart and brain coherence and you you're in that theta state. You have an intention. You have a, a, a mind picture, a mind movie in your mind's eye of exactly the outcome that you're looking, you know, whether you're broadcasting love for the greater good of all, whether you're, um, you know, trying to manifest a new job, a new partner, a new love interest, a new car, or whatever. Uh, you're trying to manifest, you know, uh, no longer having diabetes, so you're focusing on optimizing health, or maybe you broke your hip and now you're visualizing and your intention is to be completely healed again so despite the fact that you have an intention we're still taught with dr joe yeah you go ahead you go there with that intention but there's always this aspect of us that is open to the unexpected because i know that um as you know and i i shared this with you um a few times where on march 22nd dr joe had meditations that started from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. It was basically solid from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And the only thing is that we would stop at the top of every hour for like five minutes so we could go to the bathroom, get water, and then resume the meditation. And um, my pure intention for that entire time was I was showing up and the last like five, six weeks, my intention and my meditations have, have been to spread heart coherence, and love and joy to, to the entire globe so that every being that's on the globe receives that love because I know that then they'll entrain to that love vibration and if there's anything that's not resonating, that's dissonant, any kind of disease, any kind of just thing that isn't right, that then they'll be elevated and they'll be free from that, they'll be healed. So that's been my intention and despite my intention being just coming from that place. And I was so excited because it's such a great feeling to do. And, and um, so there's a lot of, you know, all of us, you know, every group meditation I know that I've been and that you've been, there's always that sense of joy and anticipation because it's a really cool thing to do. It's cool to do alone, but it's magnified when we do it with others. So for me too, in the midst of that, uh, towards the, the two to three o'clock meditation, all of a sudden I had this mystical experience. Well, the reason why that came in is because I didn't resist what was coming, was being revealed to me. And the next thing I knew I was gone. I didn't know where I was gone, going to, 
but I was, I don't even really know how it happened. But most things in our meditations, we don't know how they happen there. You're just in that open state where you do, you're not fearing, you're affirming, you know that you're letting go because that's your intention. You are intending to let go, to surrender. You're open to the progress. You're open to that infinite intelligence to come to you, through you, whatever languaging, doesn't matter. You're just, you're open. And in that openness, that's where the unpredictable, the unexpected can come in and meet you and change you and do things to you. And I think people need to know that the unpredictable, the unexpected doesn't necessarily have to be bad. Sometimes even when you have bad things, they may be bad or seemingly bad in the moment. And then later you realize, wow, that really, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have had all this other awesome stuff happen. I'm actually glad that that happened, even though it was kind of like, oh, and you're like, wait a minute, I gotta slow down, yada, yada, yada. And you allowed the unexpected and the unpredictable to come forth. And I kind of feel like we're in a circle because it's like that's getting out of your own way to allow the divine to come in and to, these, to do these magical things. What do you, what, what, does that make sense to you, Jennifer? That makes total sense to me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and I think when we have that pure intention, like you said, of, of sending out love to everyone, it's just even more, um, our experience is always even more amplified. And that's been what I've been holding to. I meditated for like four hours today. And I just kept being every time I like came back to my consciousness, I was like, you know, coherence will will entrain incoherence and order will entrain chaos and so i just held that intention that as long as we who are meditating and holding that are holding the coherence so i kept returning to my heart every time i realized i wasn't there so that i could you know know that when i'm in that state and all of us around the world meditating in that state we are in training and it's only a matter of time and then also what you said about um about the like room for the things that we perceive as bad as well i think like i like to think of everything that appears to be negative as healing um and like last night i did in the middle of the night the four hour pineal gland meditation on cohill uh-huh and I don't know when was when. It seemed like it was like five minutes <laughs> part of it. Yeah, you don't have time, so it's hard to like, say. I don't know which hour was which or what, but I had a really beautiful, really beautiful, like transcendental moment for part of it um, that was like so amazing. And I was so grateful. And I was just like, is there more? You know, like just so much gratitude. And then in the next part, like I said, I have no idea, like, which hour this was or whatever. But in the next part, I had this really terrible pain for what seemed like an hour and in, in pain, pain that I haven't had before. And I was just like, wow, like how is this possible that this is following what I just had that was so beautiful? And it was so much pain that, that my body was like, you know, you have to get up, you have to move, you have to go do something, like try to like work this out. And I was like, no, this must be the clearing, like the physical clearing from whatever just happened. So whereas like my, my ego mind and my body itself both wanted to be like, this is terrible, you know, yeah. and, and stop. I was just like, no, I'm just going to trust that this is healing and this is clearing something that I didn't even know needed to be cleared. Exactly. Oh, that is so beautiful because yes, in, um, sometimes it is painful to remove unwanted energies because you're, 
your physical body is going, no, I don't want to let this go. This is, we're used to this. This is familiar. Even though this is painful and it's causing you grief, your body's going, I don't want to let this go. And the energy is going, we're trying to push this out. And your body's kind of clenching down going, no, we want to hang on to this because this is what we're used to. And so, but you had enough awareness that, oh, this is energy moving in the body. There's, it's like a purge. And, um, and you, ha you knew not to be afraid of the pain. That that pain was just there to have you recognize that something needed to be let go of. And so you let it move through you and out of you. And if you hadn't, then it would still be with you. And at some point in the future, you would have to eventually let it go. Or if you choose to never let it go, you know, the divine is not going to take away your free will. It's all up to you. Do you want to hold on to it? Or do you, do you really want to let it go? Because if you let that go, can you imagine what else is going to come in? Something good is going to take the place of that unwanted. Yeah, great point. Yeah, so that is, that's, that's fantastic. Wow. Um, you know, and that's funny that you mentioned the thing about pain because um, I remember some, a few years ago that I would identify, I didn't know it, it was like an unconscious thing where I was afraid of pain. It wasn't often that I would have pain, but if I had pain, pain would invoke fear in me. For some reason, if I had a pain, it would make me afraid. And it's like, you know, why are those two linked together? I don't know. I don't know what happened in my life to make me equate pain to triggering fear, but it was there. And then I had to recognize, it's like, you know what? No, it's like, you know, pain is pain. There's, it's trying to show me something. So there's no reason to be afraid of that. Yeah, have you heard the acronym for pain? Pay attention inside now. Oh, no, I've never heard that before. I love that. Pay attention inside now. Oh, that is awesome. I got to write that down. Beautiful, right? Pay attention inside now. Inside. Never heard that. That is a great acronym. Yeah, I think, you know, the pain is a messenger. Yeah. As long as we stay in the awareness. Okay, pain. What is this pain? And don't identify with it, but this pain is here to teach me something. And what is it here to teach me? And where I am at is like, I don't even really, you know, if, if I need to know, great, show me. But I'm also just, I'll just let it go. You know, what a, whatever it is, I'll just let it go. I don't have to examine it and do work no. around it always. We can just let it go too. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? That's part of the act of, like Dr. Joe says, you have to let go. You have to surrender. You need to be willing for the energy. Because sometimes we're so conditioned to having to do everything. The only doing that we need to do in this practice is the surrendering and letting go. Because as you and I have both experienced, sometimes the energy of the divine that manifests either as angels or as beings from other dimensions, or sometimes we don't even know what it is that's going on, but it starts working on you and you have no control. But in order for that to happen, you have to let go and surrender then those beings come in and do whatever it is and you're just there experiencing it and you don't really have to do anything and then before you know it it's done now what is done i have no idea but afterwards you know it's an extraordinary experience but then afterwards then little by little you start realizing this change that change you're like oh my gosh so that must be from from that biological upgrade. That's what Dr. Joe calls those biological upgrades. Whenever you have energy moving throughout your body like that, that's uncontrollable. You know, you're getting a biological upgrade. Yes, you are. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I didn't know until after I finished meditating, I, med I meditated most of today, which was not my intention. My original intention was 
um, I had certain things I was going to do from 12 to 6 p.m. None of those things got done. But I've been like really sensitive to the energy of of just everything around me, you know, from a larger perspective, especially as we do these meditations, you know, how your awareness, because, you know, he takes us into, you know, literally into the void, into outer space, like way far out. So I just had this, um, you know, feeling attraction or inclination to just be in meditation. So I just, you know, I'm like, I just meditated really most of the day. And then before I knew it, when I finally finished and I looked at my clock, it was 9, 19 PM. I said, Oh my gosh, I spent the entire day meditating. I'm like, that is so cool. Um, I had some insights and stuff, but nothing spectacular happened. But I did notice that I kept on having here and there intermittently. I kept on having like this funny little pain in the middle of my chest. And I haven't had pain before in any meditation. So I thought, what is that? Why is it that I'm feeling kind of that kind of a piercy kind of a pain, like right in the middle of my chest? And then I thought, I wonder if it's because I've been really, you know, in my meditations, I've been very mindful, very much intending to completely open my heart and to really broadcast the frequency of love you know, as far as I possibly can, maybe it's because maybe I haven't exercised. This is me intellectualizing because I don't know. I'm just, I'm just sharing this with you and whoever's listening to this at the same time. But I'm thinking that's, that's the only logical explanation. I thought it's like, maybe, maybe I've never broadcasted this much love this long, you know, and maybe it's just the reaction of the human body to that amount of energy. You know what I mean? But I don't know. I just know that I kept on having, you know, here and there, and it just it would sometimes catch my attention, and I'm like, okay, it's it's not a big deal. It's like I knew it wasn't anything to worry about. It's just that something it was unexpected, but I knew that it was also energy moving. So I'm like, okay, I think that's a, I'm taking it as a good sign, just as you were taking, you know, your pain that you were feeling as a good sign. It's like, okay, something's happening. So, okay, I'm going to continue on here. So, but being predictable is not how the unknown works. That's for sure. The unknown is unfamiliar, uncertain, but it's also exciting because it occurs in ways you cannot expect or anticipate. So let me ask you, how much room in your routine, predictable life, do you have for the unknown? By staying in the known, following the same sequence each day of thinking the same thoughts, making the same choices, demonstrating the same programmed habits, recreating the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns to reaffirm the same familiar feeling called you, you're repeating the same level of mind over and over again. So in time, your brain becomes automatically programmed to do any one of those particular sequences more easily and effortlessly the next time. And then the next time and so on and so on. So as each of these individual steps merge into one complete step, thinking a familiar thought of an experience of somebody or something at some place in some time will automatically create the anticipation of the feeling of the experience. So if you can predict the feeling of any experience, you are still in the unknown. I'm sorry, you're still in the known. So for instance, the thought of having a meeting with the same team of people you have worked with for years can automatically cause you to call up the emotion of what that future event will feel like. So when you can predict the feeling of that future event because you've had enough past experiences to make it known to you, you're probably going to be creating more of the same. And of course, you're right, but that's because you are the same. By the same means, if you are in the automatic program and you cannot predict a feeling of an experience in your life, you will probably be hesitant to engage it. So we need to look at one more aspect of thinking and feeling to get the full picture of what's happening when you keep living in the same state of being. This thinking feeling loop also produces a measurable electromagnetic field that surrounds 
the physical body, our physical bodies. In fact, our bodies are always emitting light, energy, or frequencies that carry a specific message, information, or intention. Listen, I'm going to read that one more time because I think that sentence is so important. In fact, our bodies are always emitting light, energy, or frequencies that carry a specific message, information, or intention. And he has in parentheses here, by the way, when I say light, I am not just referring to the light we see, but to all spectrums of light, including x-rays, cell phone waves, and microwaves. In the same way, we also receive vital information that is carried on different frequencies. So we are always sending and receiving electromagnetic energy. So I'm going to stop here for a second because I think that we sometimes think it's like, yeah, we put a cheery face outside and, you know, we say pretty flowery, loving things. But if in your head, literally your thoughts are, I'm like, gosh, what an, you know, that guy over there was such a jerk or gosh, you know, I'm so stupid. I'm kind of looking haggity and old and um, man, you know, I can't stand, you know, so-and-so or, oh, look at that politician. You know, he's such a beast and blah, blah, blah. you're thinking all this garbage guess what? Your light, your frequency, your electromagnetic fleet, uh, field, it's going to have, um, it's going to have dissonance to it. You're not going to have a pure electromagnetic field. You're not going to have a pure broadcasting of, of energy. There's going to, you know, some people are going to receive the positive things that you're thinking and the jabs that you're throwing here and there. There are people who are going to receive that. People are going to feel that. And that's why it's important for us to be able to learn to master ourselves. And the only way you can master yourselves is in meditation, because you have to take the time to quiet yourself, to be alone with your own thoughts, your own feelings, and the emotions that are actually recorded in our bodies. And as you feel your body respond like my shaking legs on that eye beam as you hear the thoughts of your brain that don't serve you you hear your ego trying to keep you small and trying to say that things are impossible or what, what have you until you're aware that wait a minute you're not those thoughts you're not those feelings you're not those emotions this is the true you then you can take your awareness and your focus and you can silence them. You can order them to be gone and you can order your brain just like you, you know, the keys of a computer keyboard. I'm going to hit command C to copy this information. Command V, I'm going to paste it. I'm going to select all of the info. All of this is good information on this page. Command A, you're use that's how you're using your brain with your focused awareness. Now you're saying, okay, this is what I want. Okay, we're going to move on. So in the same way, we also receive vital information that is carried on different frequencies. So we are always sending and receiving electromagnetic energy. Here's how it works. When we think a thought, those networks of neurons that fire in our brain create electrical charges. When those thoughts also cause a chemical reaction that results in a feeling or an emotion, as well as when a familiar feeling or emotion is driving our thoughts, those feelings create magnetic charges and they merge with thoughts that create the electric charges to produce a specific electromagnetic field equal to your state of being. So think of emotions as energy in motion. When someone experiencing a strong emotion walks into a room their energy aside from their body their body language is often palpable we have all felt another person's energy and intent when they were angry or very frustrated we felt it because they were emitting a strong signal of energy that carried specific information and the same is true of a very sexual person a person who is suffering or a person who has a calm, 
loving energy. All those energies can be sensed and felt. And as you might expect, different emotions produce different frequencies. The frequencies of creative, elevated emotions like love, joy, and gratitude are much higher than the emotions of stress, such as fear and anger, because they carry different levels of conscious intent and energy. So he points out figure 2.2. If you guys are reading along and have your own book, you'll see that he says to see figure 2.2, which details some of the different frequencies associated with various emotional states. You'll read more about this concept later in the book. So emotions are energy in motion. Think about that. When I thought that my legs were betraying me or that my body was betraying me was my first thought. My body's betraying me because all of a sudden my legs were shaking. My awareness was not afraid. My brain wasn't afraid. I had already silenced my ego, but now my legs are starting to, to shake. So my body's betraying me because it has a record of the past. In the past, this type of challenge would freak me out and would make my legs shake. And that's what it's talking about. Emotions are that energy in motion. So my legs were shaking. So all energy is frequency and all frequency carries information. So based on our own personal thoughts and feelings, we are always sending and receiving information. So if we are recreating the past day after day, thinking the same thoughts and feeling the same emotions, we are broadcasting the same electromagnetic field over and over again, sending out the same energy with the same message. So from the perspective of energy and information, this means the same energy of our past continues to carry the same information, which then keeps creating the same future. Our energy then is essentially equal to our past. So the only way we can change our lives is to change our energy, to change the electromagnetic field. We are constantly broadcasting. In other words, to change our state of being, we have to change how we think and how we feel. If, if, where, you, if where you place your attention is where you place your energy, the moment you put your attention on familiar feelings and memories, you are siphoning your energy into the past, out of the present. In the same way, if your attention is constantly on all the people you have to see, the places you have to go, the things you have to do at certain times in your known familiar reality, then you're siphoning your energy out of the present moment into the predictable future. So if where you place your attention is where you place your energy, a key concept you'll read more about later in this chapter, then the moment you place your attention on a familiar emotion, your attention and your energy are in the past. If those familiar emotions are connected to a memory of some past event involving a person or an object at a particular place in time, then your attention and your energy are in the past as well. As a consequence, you are siphoning your energy out of the present moment back into your past. By the same means, if you start thinking about all the people you have to see, the things you have to do, and the places you have to go at certain times in your routine day, you are siphoning your attention and energy into a predictable known future. So take a look at figure 2.3, which illustrates the point. All of your energy is now completely commingled with those known experiences in that specific line of time. Your energy is creating more of the same and your body is going to follow your mind to the same events in your same reality. So your energy is being directed out of the present moment into the past and the future. So as a result, you have very little energy left to create an unknown experience in a new timeline. Figure 2.3 also shows you how the electromagnetic energy you emanate is a vibrational match with everything known to you. So as you start your day, when you have the thought of the toilet and the next thing you know, 
The next thing you know, there you are walking toward the toilet. Then you have the thought of the shower and you find yourself in the shower, adjusting the water temperature. You have the thought of the coffee maker and you're projecting your attention and energy to the coffee maker. And as you automatically walk to the kitchen to make your morning cup of java, once again, your body is following your mind. And if you've done that for the last 22 years, your body is going to effortlessly coast right over there. Your body is always following your mind. But in this case, it's been, it's been repeatedly following your mind to the known. And that's because that's where your attention and therefore your energy is. So let's, let me ask you this. Could it ever be possible for your body to start following your mind to the unknown? If so, you can see that you would have to change where you put your attention. And that would lead to changing your energy, which would require you to change how you think and how you feel long enough for something new to happen. While it may sound incredible, this is indeed possible. It makes sense that just as you move your body and just as your body has been following your mind to every known experience in your life, like the coffee maker every morning, if if you were to start investing your attention and energy into the unknown, your body would then be able to follow your mind into the unknown, a new experience in the future. Priming your mind and body for a new future. So if you are familiar with my work, you know that I'm in love with the concept of mental rehearsal. I am fascinated by how we can change the brain as well as the body by thought alone. Think about that for a moment. If you focus your attention on a specific imagery in your mind and become very present with a sequence of repeated thoughts and feelings, your brain and body will not know the difference between what is occurring in the outer world and what is happening in your inner world. So when you're fully engaged and focused, the inner world of imagination will appear as an outer world experience and your biology will change accordingly. That means you can make your brain and your body look as if a physical experience has already happened without having the actual experience. What you put your attention on and mentally rehearse over and over and over again, not only becomes who you are, from a biological perspective, it also determines your future. So here's a good example. A team of Harvard researchers, they took a group of volunteers who had never played the piano and divided the group in half. So one half practice a simple five finger piano exercise for two hours a day, over and over, over, for a period of five days. The remaining half did the same thing, but just by imagining they were sitting at the piano without physically moving their fingers in any way. The before and after brain scans showed that both groups created a dramatic number of new neural circuits and new neurological programming in the region of their brains that controls finger movements, even though one group did so by thought alone. Think about this. The folks who mentally rehearsed the actions had brains that looked like the experience had already happened, even though they never lifted a finger. If you were to put them in front of a piano after five days of mental rehearsal, many of them would be able to play the exercise they imagined pretty well even though they had never before tickled the ivories. By mentally imagining the activity every day, they installed the neurological hardware in preparation for the experience. They repeatedly fired and wired those brain circuits with their attention and intention. And over time, the hardware became an automatic software program in their brains, and it became easier to do the next time. So if they were to start to play after five days of mental practice, 
their behaviors would become easily aligned with their conscious intentions because they primed their brains for the experience ahead of time. That's how powerful the mind can be once trained. Similar studies show the same kind of results with muscle training. In a pioneering study at the Cleveland Clinic, 10 research subjects between the ages of 20 and 35 imagined flexing one of their biceps as hard as they could in five training sessions a week for 12 weeks. Every other week, the researchers, the researchers recorded the subject's electrical brain activity during their sessions and measured their muscle strength. And by the, end of the sub, by the end of the study, the subjects had increased their bicep strength by 13.5%, even though they hadn't actually been using their muscles at all. They maintained this gain for three months after the training sessions stopped. So more recently, a research team made up of scientists from the University of Texas at San Antonio the Cleveland Clinic and the Kessler Foundation Research Center in West Orange, New Jersey, asked subjects to just visualize contracting their elbow flexor muscles. And as they did so, they were instructed to urge the muscles to flex as strong and as hard as possible, adding a firm intention to their strong mental energy for 15 minute sessions, five days a week for a total of 12 weeks. So one group of subjects was instructed to use what is called external or third person imagery, imagining themselves performing the exercise by observing themselves in a scene, in their heads, separate from the experience, like watching a movie of themselves. The second group was instructed to use internal or first person imagery. So imagining that their bodies as they existed right then in real time were doing the exercise, making it more immediate, you know, and realistic. So a third group, the control, did no practice. The group using external imagery as well as a control group showed no significant change, but the group using internal imagery showed a 10.8% increase in strength. So another team of researchers from Ohio University went so far as to wrap the wrists of 29 volunteers in surgical casts for a month, ensuring they wouldn't be able to move their wrists even unintentionally. Half the group practiced mental imagery exercises for 11 minutes a day, five days a week imagining they were flexing their immobilized wrist muscles while actually remaining completely still. The other half, the control group, did nothing. At the end of the month, when all the casts came off, the muscles of the imagery group were twice as strong as those of the control group. Each of these three muscle studies show how mental rehearsal not only changes the brain, but can also change the body by thought alone. In other words, by practicing their behaviors in their mind and consciously reviewing the activity on a regular basis, the bodies of the subjects looked like they had been physically performing the activity, and yet they never did the exercises. Those who added the emotional component of doing the exercise as hard as possible to the intensity of the mental imagery made the experience even more real and the results more pronounced. So in the piano playing study, the brains of the research subjects looked as though the experience they'd imagined had already happened because they had primed their brains for the future. In a similar way, the subjects in the muscle flexing studies changed their bodies to look as if they had previously experienced that reality just by mentally rehearsing the activity through thought alone. So you can see why when you wake up in the morning and start thinking about the people you have to see, the places you have to go, the things you have to do in your busy schedule that's mentally rehearsing, and then you add an intense emotion to it like suffering or unhappiness or frustration, just like the elbow flexor volunteers who urge their muscles to flex without moving them at all. You are conditioning your brain and body to look like that future has already happened. Since experience enriches the brain, 
and creates an emotion that signals the body, when you continuously create an inward experience, that is as real as an outer experience. Over time, you're going to change your brain and body, just like any real world experience. In fact, when you wake up and start thinking about your day, neurologically and biologically, chemically, and even genetically, which I will explain in the next section, it looks as though that day has already happened for you. And in fact, it has. Once you actually start the day's activities, just as in the experiments above, your body is naturally and automatically going to behave equal to your conscious or unconscious intentions. If you've been doing the same things for years on end, those circuits, as well as the rest of your biology, are more readily and easily activated. That's because not only do you prime your biology every day with your mind, but you also recreate the same physical behaviors in order to reinforce those experiences further in your brain and in your body. So, and it actually becomes easier to go unconscious every day because you keep mentally and physically reinforcing the same habits over and over again, creating the habit of behaving by habit. So making genetic changes. You know, before we move on there, I do want to say something that um, whenever I have had an unwanted challenge, emergency, surprise, uh, an unexpected situation that is unwanted, unacceptable, um, like for example, when I had my phone stolen uh, when I was in Sardinia, I'm like, oh my gosh, um, first I thought it was lost and then I realized it was stolen. Well, I had to get my phone back, my boarding pass, all of my plans. I, I mean, I needed my phone for more than just texting and checking email. I had just, you know, all my travel plans, everything was in there. So I had to get my cell phone back. So I immediately, once I realized that it was stolen, I'm like, okay, I gotta slow my heart rate down, slow down my breathing. I have to get into theta state. And I had to focus on what it was that I wanted, which was I, I immediately started visualizing the how I didn't figure out. I just saw someone putting the cell phone back in my hand and my just going, oh my gosh, you're a rock star. You're so awesome. You're so phenomenal. In my mind's eye, I saw a man and I did have a man, you know, a young man who was like 25 years old, who actually, he's the one who helped me find, you know, and get back and recover the phone. And then I'm like, you're a Superman, you're a rock star, blah, 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 blah. And it was interesting because as I created that image in my mind of, of Matteo finding the phone, recovering it and putting it in my hand. And then I was like in so much joy and in so much love. I was like, oh my God, you're so awesome. You did it. You made the possible, the impossible. You made it possible you know, you're amazing, you know, well, when he actually put that phone in my hand, you would think it would have been like a deja vu. And it wasn't a deja vu. It was like a rewind of what I had already seen in my mind. It was verbatim, word for word, emotions. It was like a do over. It was bizarre. So it was pleasantly surprising to see how it was a repeat of emotions and of outcome. And that is what he's trying to tell us here in terms of that, the power of that mental rehearsal and how it does affect our outside environment. If our outside environment has something that is unwanted, that we don't like, that we don't want, we can change it by going into 5D. We just do an open-eyed walking meditation, which is what Dr. Joe te teaches us to do. So I had to share that with you guys because the whole idea and purpose of us reviewing and reading this book and discussing it is to make it real world life application so that you're empowered to use this and to, to do it so that you start benefiting from it. Okay. Next section is making genetic changes. So we used to think that genes created disease and that we were at the mercy of DNA. So if many people in someone's family died of, a, of some sort of heart disease, we assumed that the chances were 
pretty high that you would be developing heart disease as well. So, but we know through the science of epigenetics that it's not the gene that creates disease, but the environment that programs our genes to create disease and not just the external environment outside the body, cigarette smoke or pesticides, for example, but also the internal environment of the body. So the environment outside our cells. So what do I mean by the environment within our body? So as I said previously, emotions are chemical feedback and the end products of experiences we have in our external environment. So as we react to a situation in our external environment that produces an emotion, the resulting internal chemistry can signal our genes to either turn on, upregulating, or producing an increased expression of the gene, or to turn off, downregulating, or producing a decreased expression of the gene. The gene itself doesn't physically change the expression of the gene changes, and that expression is what matters most because that is what affects our health and our lives. And even though someone may have a genetic predisposition for a particular disease, for example, if their genes continue to express health instead of expressing that disease, they won't develop the condition and will remain healthy. Think of the body as a finely tuned instrument that produces proteins. Every one of our cells, except red blood cells, makes proteins. I'm going to read that again. Every one of our cells except red blood cells makes proteins, which are responsible for the body's physical structure and physiological function. For example, muscle cells make specific proteins known as actin and myosin, and skin cells make the proteins collagen and elastin. Immune cells make antibodies, thyroid cells make thyroxine, bone marrow cells make hemoglobin, some of our eye cells make keratin, while our pancreatic cells make enzymes like protease, lipase, and amylase. There isn't an organ or a system in the body that does not rely on or produce proteins. They are a vital part of our immune system, digestion, cell repair, and bone and muscle structure, you name it. They're part of it. In a very real way then, the expression of proteins is the expression of life and is equal to the health of the body. So in order for a cell to make a protein, a gene must be expressed. That's the job of the genes, to facilitate making proteins. So when the signal from the environment outside of the cell reaches the cell membrane, the chemical is accepted by a receptor outside of the cell and makes its way to the DNA inside the cell. Then a gene makes a new protein that's equal to that signal. So if the information coming from outside of the cell does not change, the gene keeps making the same protein and the same body stays the same. Over time, the gene will begin to downregulate. It will either shut off its healthy expression of proteins or it will eventually wear out like making a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, causing the body to express a different quality of proteins. Different classifications of stimuli upregulate and downregulate genes, and we activate experience-dependent genes, for example, by doing new things or learning new information. These genes are responsible for stem cells getting the instructions to differentiate transforming into whatever type of cell the body needs at that particular time to replace cells that are damaged. So we activate behavioral state dependent genes when we are in high levels of stress or arousal or in altered states of awareness like dreaming. You can think of these genes as a fulcrum of mind-body connection because they provide a link between our thoughts and our bodies, allowing us to influence our physical health through various behaviors meditation, prayer, or social rituals, for example. When genes are altered in this way, sometimes within minutes, those altered genes can then be passed on to the next generation. So when you change your emotions, you can change the expression of your genes, turning on and others off. Because you are sending a new chemical signal to your DNA, which can then instruct your genes to make different pro 
proteins upregulating and downregulating to make all kinds of new building blocks that can change the structure and function of your body. For example, if your immune system has been subject to living in the emotion of stress for too long and has certain genes activated for inflammation and disease, you can turn on new genes for growth and repair and switch off the old genes responsible for disease. And at the same time, these epigenetically altered genes will begin to follow new instructions, making new proteins and programming the body for growth and repair and healing. So this is how you can successfully recondition your body to a new mind. So as you read earlier in this chapter, this means that if you're living by the same emotions day in and day out, your body believes it's in the same environmental conditions then those feelings influence you to make the same choices, causing you to demonstrate the same habits that then create the same experiences that then produce the same emotions all over and over and over again. So thanks to these automatic programmed habits, your cells are constantly being exposed to the same chemical environment outside your body, in your environment, as well as outside the cells, but within your body. So that chemistry keeps signaling the same genes in the same way. And so you're stuck because when you stay the same, your genetic expression stays the same. And now you are headed for genetic destiny because you don't have any new information coming from the environment. But what if the circumstances in your life change for the better? Shouldn't that also change the chemical environment surrounding your cells? Yes, that happens, but not all the time. If you spent years conditioning your body to the cycle of thinking and feeling, and then feeling and thinking without realizing it, you've also conditioned your body to become addicted to those emotions. So simply changing the external environment by, say, getting a new job doesn't necessarily break that addiction any more than someone addicted to drugs would be able to stop their cravings just by winning the lottery or moving to Hawaii because of the thinking feeling loop sooner or later. After the novelty of the experience is over, most people return to the baseline emotional state and the body believes it is in the same old experience that created the same old emotions. So if you were miserable in your old job, but managed to get a new one, you might be happy for a few weeks or even a few months. But if you had spent years conditioning your body to be addicted to misery, you would eventually return to that old emotion because your body would crave its chemical fix. Your outer environment may have changed, but your body will always believe its internal chemistry more than its external conditions. So it remains emotionally locked into your old state of being, still addicted to those old emotions. That's just another way of saying you're still living in the past. And because that internal chemistry hasn't changed, you can't change the expression of your genes to make new proteins in order to improve the structure, of, uh, the structure or the function of your body. So there's no change in your health or your life. That's why I say you have to think greater than the way you feel to make any real lasting changes. So in the winter of 2016, at our advanced workshop in Tacoma, Washington, my team and I performed a study on the effect elevated emotions had on immune function, taking saliva samples from 117 subjects at the start of our workshop. And then four days later at the workshop's conclusion, we measured immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin, which is IgA, a protein marker for the strength of the immune system. IgA is an incredibly powerful chemical, one of the primary proteins responsible for healthy immune function and the internal defense system. It's constantly fighting a barrage of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other organisms that invade or are already living within the body's internal environment. It's so powerful that it's better than any flu shot or any immune system booster you could ever possibly take. When it's activated, it's the primary internal defense system in the human body. So when stress levels, and therefore the levels of stress hormones like cortisol, go up, this lowers the levels of IgA. 
thereby compromising and downregulating the immune system's expression of the gene that makes the protein. So during our four-day workshop, we asked our, studi our study participants to move into an elevated emotional state such as love, joy, inspiration, or gratitude for nine to 10 minutes, three times a day. If we could elevate our emotions, we wondered, could we boost our immune system? In other words, could our students upregulate the genes for IgA simply by changing their emotional states? Well, the results amazed us. Average IgA levels shot up by 49.5%. The normal range for IgA is 37 to 87 milligrams per deciliter. But some people measured more than 100 milligrams per deciliter at the end of the workshop. Our test subjects showed significant measurable epigenetic changes without having any significant experiences in their external environment. By attaining states of elevated emotion, even for just a few days, just four days, their bodies began to believe that they were in a new environment. So they were able to signal new genes and change their genetic expression. In this case, the protein expression of the immune system. And I wanna show, see if I can show you from my, I don't know if you guys can see in, uh, I'm holding this up to the camera so that you can see the diagram. I have my paper book on the other side of the room. Otherwise I would bring that up to the camera for, for the next, for chapter three, I'll be sure to do that. Okay, that is incredible. Just four days. So I'm gonna show it to you again because I actually didn't show it. I guess it flipped pages. So here you go again. Now you see the diagram? Okay. So, so as we practice, as we practice maintaining elevated emotions and changing our new energy, we can literally upregulate new genes that make new healthy proteins to strengthen our internal defense system. And as we reduce our survival emotions and minimize the need for our external protection system, we downregulate genes for the production of stress hormones. Uh, let's see, it has here, Sig A in the figure above stands for saliv oh, salivary immunoglobulin. So that's, they're gonna test it through saliva. Cortisol represents stress hormones. Both were measured, oh, yeah, and then it says here, both were measured in saliva. As opposed to doing a blood withdrawal, they took salivary samples in order to measure the IgA levels. So this means that you might not need a pharmacy. Imagine that. You, you may not need a pharmacy or an exogenous substance to heal you. You have the power from within to upregulate your genes that make IgA within a few days, just four days. Something as simple as moving into an elevated state of joy, love, inspiration, or gratitude for five to 10 minutes a day can produce significant epigenetic changes in your health and body. So I'm gonna stop right here. Jennifer, can you imagine if, if the folks who are watching this video, if they choose to every time they tune into our chapter one, two, three, any chapter of Becoming Supernatural, if they choose to just embrace a state of joy, love, inspiration, or gratitude for the first 10 minutes of each one of those videos, within four days, they could potentially have their IgA levels up to 49.5% higher than they would have had had they not done that at all. That's pretty cool, don't you think? Definitely, yeah. I think this...
information about epigenetics is so important and i always feel like yeah everybody knows this information now but that's just the people that are in my environment exactly and most people really don't and so my hope and intent is that people read this and feel empowered because i hear all the time people saying like you know they start right in with their story like my dad had this or you know i whatever it is and they really truly believe and are programming their body to believe that their genes create their destiny and it's just not true and it's not taught you know in school yet and hopefully it will be but i just yeah i just think it's so important for people to know that and to really take back their power and since i started doing this work i haven't even gotten like a cold so whatever's happening with me that i'm working on is one thing but in terms of like you know it's been flu seasons and whatever else and it just haven't it's just not in my awareness i just know that i control my state and that that's just not gonna affect me and i just hear people all the time even before this covid saying like well it's flu season you know it's like doesn't matter it doesn't have to affect you you know yeah, it doesn't have to and and if we were to take your iga levels because you do you do a lot of meditating you meditate every day and it's not just like one meditation a day but i mean the proof is right here in this group of people where only four days they just had an elevated state of joy love inspiration or gratitude for up to 10 minutes, that's it. Just 10 minutes a day of an elevated state of gratitude. Now, knowing this, it makes so much sense. I had my, um, my sister-in-law's father, who about 20, I wanna say about 22, yeah, it was about 22 years ago, 23 years ago, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And um, he used to smoke a lot and he used to drink, I think like two cases. I didn't even know that was humanly possible for you to, to drink two cases of beer over a, like Friday to Sunday. He would just drink and smoke, drink and smoke. And um, that's, I would guess maybe that's what gave him the prostate cancer. So once he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, the doctor told him he had six months to two years to live. Um, and needless to say, that was shocking. So he quit drinking, he quit smoking, and then he started something that I called it laugh therapy, because then every day he would watch comedies. He watched funny movies, he watched sitcoms, he watched, he just surrounded himself with funny. And you know what? He lasted 15 more years. Mm, beautiful. 15 more years. And he probably would have been gone within either the six months or the two had he continued smoking and drinking and the same mental state that he had. But instead he made those changes and just, he was laughing. And then every time I saw him, you would never think he had any kind of cancer because he was always laughing and he was always talking about funny things. His new thing was joy. He was in a constant state of joy. Mind you, he was taking care of his wife who was, who was very ill too, who couldn't do anything. He had to do everything for her. Um, interestingly enough, you know, he, he, you know, he passed away, but the point is he completely radically changed his life. He obviously had high motivation, but he was in a constant state of joy and he lasted 15 more years. So in my book, he beat the cancer amazing yeah that's beautiful and that's great that he didn't think like so many people do oh the doctor said i have this many months to live that's it and gave up no he no. he instead what he did give up yeah he gave up he gave beer he gave yeah. up drinking a lot i had no idea that he i never saw him under the i never saw him drunk but apparently he gave up drinking and he gave up smoking 
and he took up watching funny movies, funny sitcoms, collecting jokes. He was always flashing his pearly whites. He always had a funny joke, a funny thing to share with you. It was all about funny, 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 funny. And it's like, well, yeah, he probably boosted his IGA levels over 50%, especially he was doing it for more than 10 minutes a day. Yeah. So probably, I don't know what his numbers must have been, but I'm sure he, you know, it's no wonder he lasted 15 more years after that. And he had a good quality of life. It's not like 15 years in and out of the hospital. So, so yeah, so th this, if we just do it, I'm so glad that one of the things that I think that is so brilliant about Dr. Joe is that he dovetails the science along with the mystical practices and he supports what the mystical practices are doing to us neuroendocrinology wise, neurochemically, um, what the biophysiology is. And then he's actually tested it. You know, he has electroencephalograms where, you know, he hooks up people, you know, our brains are actually wired in the, in the events. He, you know, takes out blood. He, you know, he uh, measures the telomere length at the beginning of the advanced, um, you know, workshop in the monastery. And then, you know, after days three, four, five, six, and seven, you know, all that data he has, uh, I'm trying to think all the different other things that he tests for in addition to IgA, our brain waves. Uh, it does heart coherence too. With an HRV. Oh, that's the other thing. Yes, heart coherence. Because he has people from the Heart Math Institute, the scientists, they come down, that team. And, and there's, I know they're from multiple different, um, not only medical schools and research centers from different parts of the world, they all come together. So they're not, that's the other thing. None of this data can be manipulated because it's a collaboration that he picks from people from all over. So you can't say, oh, this medical school is trying to manipulate the data to get research dollars or anything like that. So all of it then is compiled, you know, by, by Dr. Joe. He then hands it over to like three, four. It used to be three medical schools. Now he has up to four medical schools. As of March of this year, 2020, he now has UCSD also involved. They've got research scientists that are now also testing and, and they're reviewing all this data. They are participating in measuring you know, they have neurologists and, you know, the list goes on and on the different types of scientists that are actually hands on measuring this. And, um, and many of them are going with, it's like, based on their education and their experience, they're like, this is impossible. And he's like, I know. And, you know, the other scientists is like, yeah, we know, but this is what we've been measuring for the last, you know, two, three years. It's, and that's why it's so extraordinary. And that's why we have to have all this data compiled and published and papers need to be written so that other uh, science professionals, physicians, doctors, healers, practitioners, therapists, et cetera, are able to use this data to then set their proper expectations that the impossible is possible, it isn't impossible, and that people can heal an extraordinary, what some people will call, you know, to biblical proportions, really. And so, um, yeah, I think that's what's so exciting about this. But I, I, I really love the way he dovetails, you know, the multiple disciplines of science, religion, mysticism, spirituality to support. They both, they're basically the same thing. But in our society, we think of them as two different things. And so one is supporting now the other you know, something that, you know, science has only been around two, 300 years, whereas the teachings of the mystics and um, the spiritual practice go back, you know, up to 15,000 years. So um, it's the most exciting time, I think, for you and I to be on the planet, to be able to be part of, you know, we're like these little bridges where we're trying to bridge what we're learning, what we're applying, what we're experiencing to those who are unfamiliar with it and just telling them, come on, you know, just baby steps along. Let's, let's just bring you along and let's just, you can put, you don't have to jump into the, you know, head to toe into the cold water, just dip a toe, put your foot in, let's get the water level up to the ankle. You can ease into this and, you know, start to learn and start to apply it so that now you can start to embrace it and use it for your benefit. And, uh, and then, you know, it's, it's at their rate of consumption. They can consume this information 
and consume these practices at their own pace for their own benefit. Yes. Okay. And so, the benefit of, of everyone. Say that again? And the benefit of all, because when we heal ourselves, we heal the world. Yeah, and see, that's, that's the, the, the beauty of this, is, is that when we do, when any one person heals themselves, when any one person goes into meditation for any length of time, whether it's for three minutes, 30 minutes, three hours, 30 hours, it doesn't matter. You are not just benefiting you. You automatically benefit everyone around you, whether they're a stranger, whether they're a person, whether they're a plant, whether it's an animal, it affects every, our electromagnetic field in meditation expands. Instead of it being about nine, it's about, they've measured it, I guess the average is around seven, eight, nine meters. Well, it, it gets even bigger as we do these meditative practices. So it touches everything around us. And so that's why we are so mindful and so intent filled with doing these global coherence, these uh, global coherence meditations that we do in groups. Sometimes we have, sometimes we have 20, 30, 40, 50. Sometimes we have one or 2000. You know, the intermission that we did with Dr. Joe, we had 16,000 people a day that we were doing the, the meditations every morning from 6.30 to basically 6.30 to noon every morning for um, seven days. That was like two weeks ago. But we have, we have a coherence healing that's going on as we speak right now that started at 11. It's going for five hours. There's many, many groups, thousands of people who are doing this around, around the planet. And this is helping heal, not just from COVID, this is the cool part because the energy, it doesn't care what label man is given anything. It doesn't matter, germ, virus, bacteria, fungi, any dissonant energy in any way, shape or form, it doesn't matter. This heals everything. It, it, the energy doesn't discriminate. It has no prejudice. It automatically elevates and entrains everything around it. And it becomes a dominant force. And I find that it's like, gosh, it's so cool to be part of this and know that, you know, this little girl can make a difference. Even if it was just me just doing my meditations and not even doing these, these YouTubes and these videos, it would still, it still makes a big impact. Um, so that's exciting. That's exciting and encouraging. And it's like, oh, what other unexpected things are we gonna learn, Jennifer? I don't know, but I'm open, ready, willing, and able. <laughs> okay, so appropriately, the next subtitle is Where Attention Goes, Energy Flows. So since where you place your attention is where you place your energy, when you wake up in the morning and immediately start putting your attention and energy on all the people you have to see that day, the places you have to go, the objects you own, the things you have to do in the three-dimensional world, your energy becomes fractured. Most people don't know that. I remember the first time I read that, I'm like, yikes. All of your creative energy is flowing away from you, as figure 2.5 illustrates, to all the things in the outer world that compete for your attention your cell phone, your laptop, your bank account, your house, your job, your coworkers, your spouse, your kids, your enemies, your pets, your medical conditions, and so on. So take a glance at figure 2.5. It is obvious that most people's attention and energy are directed to their outer material world. It begs the question, how much energy do you have left in your inner world of thoughts and feelings to create a new reality? Well, consider for a moment that each of these people or things you give so much attention to is a known in your life because you've experienced it. As I mentioned earlier in the chapter, you have a neurological network in your brain for each one of those things. Since they are mapped in your brain, you perceive and so experience them from your past. And the more you keep experiencing them, the more automatic and enriched the neural circuits for each of them become 
because of the redundancy of the various experiences keeps assembling and refining more and more circuits. That's what experience does. It enriches the brain. So you have a neurological network about your boss, a neurological network about money, a neurological network about your partner, a neurological network about your kids, a neurological network for your financial situation, a neurological network for your house, a neurological network about all your physical world possessions because you've experienced all of those people or things at different times and places. So where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And I'm going to see, can you see, is this too far or can you see the diagram from here? It's too like white. How about here? Mm, that's better, but uh, go up. Yeah. Okay. Get the gist. Yeah, I'll see if I can take a picture of it and we'll insert it in the recording because this is being recorded as we're as we're doing this. So, okay. So, so every person, object, thing, place, or situation in our familiar physical reality has a neurological network assigned to it in our brain and an emotional component connected to it because we've experienced all these things. And this is how energy becomes bonded to our past present reality. Therefore, as you place your attention on all these elements, your energy is flowing away from you and it leaves little energy in your inner world of thoughts and feelings to create something new in your life. If you look at the magnified portions of this figure where the two ovals intersect, these represent how we use different elements in our outer world to re firm our emotional addiction. And you may use your friends, this is a frightening thought, you may use your friends to reaffirm your addiction to suffering. You may use your enemies to reaffirm your addiction to hatred. It begs the question, how much of your creative energy could you be using to design a new destiny? When your attention and therefore your energy is divided between these outer world objects, people's problems and issues, there's no energy left for you to put in your inner world of thoughts and feelings. So there's no energy left for you to use to create something new. Why? Because how you think and how you feel literally creates your personal reality. Therefore, if you're thinking and feeling equal to everything that you know, that's the known, you keep reaffirming the same life. In fact, we could say that your personality is no longer creating your personal reality. Now your personal reality is creating your personality. Your external environment is controlling your thoughts and feelings. There's a biological match between your inner world of thoughts and feelings and your outer world, past, present reality made up of people and objects at certain times and places. You are continuously keeping your life the same because you are keeping your attentions and your thoughts and your energy feelings the same. So finally, if how you think and how you feel broadcasts an electromagnetic signature that influences every area of your life, you are broadcasting the same electromagnetic energy and your life never changes. We could say that your energy is equal to everything in your past present reality and you are recreating the past. That's not the only limitation that occurs though. When you place all your attention and energy on the outer world and you keep reacting to the same conditions in the same way, in a state of chronic stress, which causes the brain to be in a constant state of arousal, your inner world becomes imbalanced and your brain begins to work inefficiently. And then you become less effective in creating anything at all. In other words, you become a victim of your life instead of the creator of your life. So living by the hormones of stress. This is, I think, one of the most important things for people to understand and learn because it involves 
the locking of energy in the first, the second, the third energy center, which means that you don't have any energy in your body for growth and repair. And you can't think clearly, you can't make good decisions because you're locked into this fight or flight response where your energy is all tied up in your first, second, and third energy center. So living by the hormones of stress. So now let's take a closer look at how we end up getting addicted. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, how you end up getting addicted to our negative emotions or more precisely what we call the hormones of stress. The moment we act to any condition in the outer world that tends to be threatening, whether the threat is real or imagined, our body releases stress hormones in order to more mobilize enormous amounts of energy in response to that threat. I'm going to repeat that again because I think that is very important. The moment we react to any condition in our outer world, i.e. COVID, that tends to be threatening whether the threat is real or imagined or our body releases stress hormones in order to mobilize enormous amounts of energy in response to that threat. When this occurs, the body moves out of balance. That's exactly what stress is. This is a natural and healthy response because in antiquity, that chemical cocktail of adrenaline and cortisol and similar hormones were released when we were facing some sort of danger in the outer world. Maybe a predator was chasing us. For example, we had to make the decision to fight, run, or hide. When we are in survival mode, we automatically become materialists, defining reality and our senses by what we see, what we hear, what we smell, feel, and taste. We also narrow our focus and put all of our attention on matter, on our actual bodies existing in a particular space and time. So the hormones of stress cause us to give all of our attention to our outer world because that's where the danger lurks. Back in the days of early humans, of course, this response was a good thing. It was adaptive. It's what kept us alive. And once we had focused our attention on the cause and the danger had passed, the levels of all those stress hormones went back into balance. But in modern times, that's no longer the case. After just one phone call or email from our boss or a family member that elicits a strong emotional reaction, such as anger, frustration, fear, anxiety, sadness, guilt, suffering, or shame, we turn on our primitive fight or flight nervous system, causing us to react as if we were being chased by a saber tooth tiger or a predator. That same chemistry automatically stays switched on because the external threat never seems to go away. The truth is that many of us spend the majority of our time in this state of heightened arousal. It becomes chronic. It's as though the predator is not out there in the wild making an occasional toothy appearance, but instead is living in the same cave as we are, a toxic coworker whose desk is right next to us, for example. Such a chronic stress response is not adaptive. It's maladaptive. When we're living in survival mode and those hormones of stress, like adrenaline and cortisol, keep pumping through our body, we stay on high alert instead of returning to balance. As in Anna's experience in chapter one, when this imbalance is maintained long-term, chances are we're headed for disease because long-term stress down regulates the healthy expression of genes. In fact, our bodies become so conditioned to the rush of chemicals that they become addicted to them. Our bodies actually crave them. In this mode, our brains become overly alert and aroused as we try to predict, control, and force outcomes in an effort to increase our chance of survival. And the more we do this, the stronger the addiction becomes and the more we believe we are our bodies connected to our identities and our environment living in linear time. That's because that's where all of our attention is. 
when your brain is aroused and you are living in survival mode and you have to keep shifting your attention to your job, to the news, to your ex, to your friends, to your emails, to your Facebook, to your Twitter, you're activating each of these different neurological networks very quickly. Review figure 2.5. So if you keep doing this over time, the act of habitually narrowing your focus and shifting your attention compartmentalizes your brain and it no longer works in a balanced fashion. And when that happens, you are training your brain to fire in a disorder, a disordered, incoherent pattern, which causes it to work very inefficiently. And like a lightning storm in the clouds, different neural networks fire out of order. So your brain goes out of sync. The effect is similar to a group of drummers all banging on their skins at the same time, but not together with any rhythm. We will talk much more about the concept of coherence and incoherence in a later chapter, but for now it's enough to know that when your brain gets incoherent and you get incoherent, when your brain isn't working optimally, you're not working optimally. So for each outer world person or thing or place you've experienced in your life that is unknown, you have an emotional connected, an emotion connected to it because emotions, which are energy and motion, are the chemical residue of experience. And if most of the time you're living by those addictive stress hormones, you might use your boss to reaffirm your addiction to judgment. You might use your mother for your addiction to judgment or your addiction to anger or addiction to whatever emotion. You might use your coworkers to reaffirm your addiction to competition. You might use your friends to reaffirm your addiction to suffering. You might use your enemies to reaffirm your addiction to hatred. You might use your parents to reaffirm your addiction to guilt. Your Facebook feed to reaffirm your addiction to insecurity. The news to reaffirm your addiction to anger your ex to reaffirm your addiction to resentment and your relationship with money to reaffirm your addiction to lack. This means your emotions, your energy are commingled and bonded with every person, place, or thing you experience in your known familiar reality. And that means there's no energy available for you to create a new job, a new relationship, a new financial situation, a new life, or even a new healed body. So let me say it another way. If how you think and how you feel determines the frequency and the information you are emitting in your energy field, which has a significant effect on your life, and if all your attention and so all your energy is tied up in your outer world of people, objects, things, places, and time, and there's no energy left in your inner world of thoughts and feelings. Therefore, the stronger the emotion that you're addicted to, the more you will place your attention on that person, object, place, or circumstance in your outer world, giving away most of your creative energy and causing you to feel and think equal to everything you know. It becomes difficult to think or feel in any new ways when you are addicted to your outer world. And it's impossible, wait a minute, and it's possible that you can become addicted to all the people and things in your life that are causing all your problems in the first place. That's how you give your power away and mismanage your energy. If you review figure 2.5, you'll find a few examples to illustrate how we create energetic bonds to all elements in our outer world. Take a look at figure 2.6. On the left side of the diagram, you see two atoms bound by an invisible field of energy. They're sharing information. It's energy that is bonding them together. On the right side of the diagram, you see two people who are sharing an experience of resentment and who are also bonded by an invisible field of energy that keeps them connected energetically. In truth, they are sharing the same energy and so the same information. So I got to pause here. Um, I'm going to show you guys the picture here because even though two people are no longer maybe physically in the same room together and maybe they've 
had a breakup, their energy fields can still be um, connected and they're still, they're still going to be sharing energy and they're still sharing information, which is what this diagram is actually trying to show us. Can, can you see that? Yes. You see how they overlap? Mm -hmm. so I, I'm going to have to say, um, over a year ago, I had a bad breakup with um, a boyfriend. This was post my divorce. And uh, we were together for two and a half years. And then it came to a, an abrupt um, breakup. And the evening of the breakup, which it, it happened unexpectedly. And I instinctively knew I had already, you know, I've been a student, of, I was pre-med bio sci when I went to, to USC. So I have a background in pre-med and biological science and physics and all that kind of stuff. And so having been aware on my radio show, I had had Dr. Bruce Lipton, who wrote the, not only the biology of belief, he also wrote uh, a book called Creating Heaven on Earth. And he talked about the uh, he uses the periodic table of elements and he talks about having the, the six noble gases and then the rest of the elements and how the energetic fields between the six noble gases are the only six that are stable everything else is unstable so you can have sodium and chloride those two as as um, elements that are not whole they have one electron on the outer ring that's looking it's always looking to be completed by another element. So sodium, if you get it too close to chloride, it will be attracted to chloride because chloride also has, instead of having two electrons circling on its outer ring, it only has one. So it's a little off balance. As soon as sodium and chloride get close to each other, they're like, hey, I have an extra electron on my outer ring. I do too. Hey, so that we both have two circling around our outer ring. Why don't we both share each other's outer ring electron and now we're whole. So now that becomes sodium chloride. Without getting too much into the technicality of that, what that has to do, what, what I realized was that, okay, even though we you know, had our emotional exchange and our talk and we decided, yeah, we're breaking up and it was very unexpected and it was very painful. That evening, I, I decided that I didn't wanna suffer. I said, you know what? because I really loved him very much. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to go through this torturous, um, horrible uh, pain that, where it feels like my heart is going through a meat grinder. This is just, I just don't want that. And so I instinctively, I didn't have a process in mind. However, based on the things that I had studied, you know, um, from energy medicine, uh, all the way to spiritual practices, to other um, doctors, you know, that I have worked with and therapists and so forth. I instinctively knew I needed to cut the energetic bond between him and I immediately. And so I locked myself in my room. I started to do my prayers and my meditations. I called in my angels to come in and help. I went ahead and I literally cut I could see that there was a very strong, big cord between him and I. So I went ahead and I didn't just cut, I had these big shears um, in my mind's eye. And I realized I was like, whoa, this thing is like really big. It's coming out of my chest into his. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta cut this up into a thousand pieces because I don't want it, I don't want this to ever grow back. So I just chopped, 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 chopped it all up. And I have a video on my YouTube channel. Uh, because after, as I went through the process, then a few months later, I, I realized what I had done. And I said, wow, there's, there's five things that I did uh, in the, like from that evening to the following weeks that passed that got me through it. Because interestingly enough, when I went through that whole process, the next morning, I felt fine. I, first of all, I didn't sleep that night but I probably finally went to sleep and I probably got an hour and a half of sleep. So it was like a very light sleep. Um, I, after I got up from that, about eight o'clock in the morning, I got up, I didn't feel tired. I felt refreshed. I felt free, 
which was shocking to me because I did the, the process and I didn't expect to have an immediate result. I knew that it would work, but I didn't, I just did it and then let go. And the next morning I felt free. I felt good. I actually felt fantastic. And my brain was trying to make sense of this because it didn't make sense intellectually. How is this possible? Because it's such a significant relationship with someone, you know, that I love so much and for it to be so traumatic like that and so unexpected. And just by doing that one process, I felt such a tremendous amount of relief. I'm like, I felt fantastic the whole day, the whole weekend. It was crazy. So I ended up doing, there's like four or five other things that I ended up doing, you know, the next day and the next day and the next day, which I talk about in the video. But this is what Dr. Joe is talking about here. And he's talking about how two atoms, if you look up, I don't know if I can see what's the page. It's page, if you're, if, if you're reading in the book, your own book, it's page 61. And you have figure 2.6. And he talks about how two atoms are bonded to make a molecule. And then it shows right next to the two atoms that are sharing energy and information. You have two people with the same emotions and the same energy sharing the same thoughts and information. They're bonded to each other energetically. So there's science behind this. And that's what he's trying to share with us right now so that we understand as we do these meditative practices that we are connected to other people and we don't need to, if we have been addicted to, to let's say like it talks about, you know, you're feeding your addiction of, of hatred, you know, with, you know, with your boss, you have this feeling of resentment with your ex, you have this feeling of whatever that negative emotion is with your mom, whoever that person or whoever that, maybe it's a person and a circumstance or an environment, uh, what have you, you, could, you can actually stop that. You can, you can clean that up through meditation because that's what this is. This, is. this is what he's teaching us to do and that's what we're practicing in our everyday. Does that make sense? Yes. So, okay, so let's continue reading. We're almost done with this chapter. It says, just like two atoms that are bond together to form a molecule, which share energy and information, when two people share the same emotions and energy and communicate the same thoughts and information, they become bonded together as well. And in both cases, they are bound by an invisible field of energy that keeps them connected. If, if it takes energy to separate these two atoms, it's going to take energy and awareness to take our attention off the people and conditions in our life that we've given so much creative energy away to. So to separate the two atoms, it takes energy. By the same means, if your attention and energy are bound to the same people, places, and things in the outside physical world, you can understand that it's going to take energy and effort to break those bonds when you're in meditation. This begs the question, how much of your creative energy is tied up in guilt, hatred, resentment, lack, or fear? The truth is that you could be using all that energy to recreate a new destiny. So to do that, you're going to have to get beyond all those things in your outer world by taking your attention off of them. I want to pause here. Because years ago, there was a lady that was working with my best friend who lives in Hawaii. And this older lady told her, hey, all you have to do is put your hands on the steering wheel. And she goes, she told me to put the hands on the steering wheel. And she goes, I don't know what she means by that. I'm like, I don't know what she means by that either. It's like, what does it mean to put your hands on the steering wheel? Well, now I know what that means. In order for you to put your hands on the steering wheel of your life means that you need to take your awareness, your conscious mind, that is your awareness, and you're going to focus it on what you want. By focusing it on what you want, that is how you put your hands on the steering wheel. And the way you're going to move the energy 
is by using your remote control. And your remote control is the breath. And that's what Dr. Joe teaches us to take our awareness and our focus and energy is going to go and flow where our awareness goes. So we're going to take our breath. We're going to use that to slow down our heart rate, slow down our, our thoughts, slow down our, our brain waves, slow down our breath. We're going to get into that heart and brain coherence. And now we're going to use that energy. We're going to bring it up to uh, eventually it's going to get up to our pineal gland and that's where everything begins to happen because that's we're in 5d now we are in the void we're in the space we're in the blackness we're now the particle the energy waves our potential energy waveforms and they're going to turn into particle because now we're focused on them the moment we start to put our awareness and our focus on them to what we want and we start to create that motion picture in our mind's eye and replay how would we act? What would we say? What would we see? What would we experience if we're getting what we want? And now it's, we're witnessing it in our mind's eye and we see that we got it. That is turning that into particles. And then it's no wonder that once we're done with that and we let it go, pretty shortly thereafter, boom, it pops into our experience. So I had to share that with you guys, because like I said, um, those were, those are things that I have learned in this, in these teachings and application of, of these teachings. So once you overcome your emotional body and you take your attention off everything known to you in your outer world, you call your energy back to you, breaking the bonds with your past present reality, which has been staying the same. You're going to have to make the transition from being somebody to being nobody, which means you have to take your attention off your body, your pain, your hunger. You're going to have to go from being someone to being no one. Taking your attention off your identity as a partner, as a parent, and an employee. You'll have to go from keeping your attention to something to placing your attention to nothing. Forgetting all about your cell phone, your emails, getting a cup of coffee, from being somewhere to being nowhere, getting beyond any thoughts about the chair you're meditating in or where you'll be going later today, and from being in linear time to being in no time with no distracting memories or thoughts about the future. So I'm not saying that your cell phone or your laptop or your car or your bank account is bad, but when you're overly attached to those things and they've captured your attention to such a degree that you can't get beyond thinking about them, because of the strong emotions you associate with them, those possessions own you. And then you can't create something new. The only way to do that is to learn to call all of the fractured energy back so you can overcome the emotions of survival that you have become addicted to and that keep all your energy bound to your past present reality. Once you take your attention off of all those exterior elements, you start to weaken your energetic and emotional bonds with those things, and you finally begin to free up enough available energy to create a new future. So that's going to require you to become aware of where you've been consciously placing your attention. And like separating the two atoms, it's going to take some energy to consciously break those bonds. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna pause here. It, it says, it's going to take some energy to consciously break those bonds. Yes, it does take some energy, but it doesn't take an extraordinary amount of energy. You just have to decide. You need to make a choice, and then you need to do it. That's it. Do the work, and it will be done. So people come up to me all the time in workshops and tell me their computer hard drive crashed or someone stole their car, or they lost their job, and they don't have any more money. When they tell me they have lost people or things in their life, you know what I always say to them? Great! Look how much available energy you have to design a new destiny. By the way, if you do this work well and manage to call your energy back to you, it will most likely be uncomfortable at first. Even a little chaotic. Get ready, because certain areas of your life may fall apart. But don't worry. That's supposed to happen because you're breaking the energetic bonds between yourself and your same past reality. 
anything that is no longer in a vibrational match between you and your future is going to fall away. Let it. Don't try to put your old life back together because you are going to be way too busy with the new destiny you're calling to yourself. That's so true because when my boyfriend and I broke up, my life radically changed. It was a radical change and most of the things that happened in 2019, there's no way um, they would have ever happened if I would have stayed in that relationship. So that, that breakup was actually the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And it opened up an entire new world where I took a, I didn't expect to take a quantum leap, but that's actually what happened. Everything changed. I mean, I'm not going to get into the details here, but it was, it was a radical change. And it was not as uncomfortable. Um, it, what, if, if I hadn't had Dr. Joe's training, it probably would have been a lot more uncomfortable. But it wasn't as uncomfortable. It was a lot of it was jaw dropping, jaw dropping, shocking, no question. Um, but it's, it's been a, it's a phenomenal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It's been amazing. Okay. Is there something that you want to add, Jennifer? No. Okay. So we're going to keep on reading here. Here's a great example. A friend of mine who was vice president, oh, I love this example. A friend of mine who was a vice president of a university showed up for a board meeting about three weeks after he started doing the meditation work. He was the backbone of that university and the students and faculty loved him. He walked into the board meeting and sat down and they fired him. So he called me in and said, hey, I don't know if this meditation process is working. The board just fired me. Aren't things supposed to happen to me when I'm doing the work? Listen, I told him, don't you hold on to those emotions of survival because then you'll be in the past. Instead, keep finding the present moment and creating from that place. Within two weeks, he fell madly in love with a woman that he later married. He also received an offer from an even better job as a vice president of a much larger university which he gratefully accepted. I love that story. A year later, he called me again to tell me that the college that fired him was now asking him to return as president. So you never know what the universe has in store for you as your old reality falls away and your new one begins to unfold. The only thing I can assure you of is this, the unknown has never let me down calling your energy back. If you're going to disconnect from the outer world, you have to learn how to change your brain waves. This is so true. So let's talk about brain wave frequencies for a moment. Most of that time that you are awake and conscious, you are in the beta range of brain wave frequencies and beta is measured in low range, mid range and high range frequencies. Low range beta is a very relaxed state when you don't perceive any threats from the outer world, but you're still aware of your body in space and time. This is the state you are in when you're reading, paying attention to your daughter during a friendly conversation, listening to a lecture, and so forth. Mid-range beta is a slightly more aroused state, such as when you are in a group of people introducing yourself to everyone for the first time, and you have to remember everyone's name. You're more vigilant, but you're not overly stressed or completely out of balance. So think of mid beta range as a good stress. High range beta is the state you're in when you're jacked up of, on the hormones of stress. These are the brain waves you display when you exhibit any of the survival emotions, including anger, alarm, agitation, suffering, grief, or anxiety, frustration, or even depression. High beta range can be more than three times higher than low beta range and twice as high as mid beta range. So while you may spend most of your waking time in beta frequency brain waves, you also dip into alpha brain waves throughout your day. You display alpha brain waves when you're relaxed, calm, creative, and even intuitive. When you're no longer thinking or analyzing, instead you're daydreaming or imagining, like a trans state. If beta brain waves indicates when you are placing the majority 
of your attention on your outer world, alpha brain waves indicate when you're placing more of your attention on your inner world. So theta frequency brain waves take over in that twilight state when your mind is still awake, but your body is drifting off to, off to sleep. This frequency is also associated with deep states of meditation. Delta frequency brain waves usually come during sleep, during deep restorative sleep. However, over the last four years, my research team and I have recorded several students who, came, who can move into very deep delta brain waves during meditation. Their bodies are deeply asleep and they're not dreaming, but their brain scans show that their brains are processing very high amplitudes of energy. As a result, they report having profound mystical experiences, experiences of oneness, feeling connected to everyone and everything in the universe. So see figure 2.7 to compare the different brainwave states. Gamma frequency brainwaves indicate what I call a super conscious state. This high frequency energy occurs when the brain gets aroused from an internal event. One of the most common examples is during meditation when your eyes are closed and you are going within instead of an event that happens outside the body. We'll talk more about gamma brain waves in later chapters. Uh, on page 65, he has beta, alpha, theta, delta, and gamma brain waves. You can uh, open that open up to that page in the book and you'll get to see the diagram. A comparison of different brain waves. So one of the biggest challenges people have when they meditate is switching out of high range and even mid range beta and slipping into alpha and then theta brain wave frequencies. It's absolutely vital to do so because when they slow down their brain waves to these other frequencies, they are no longer paying attention to the outer world and all the distractions they're so used to thinking about when they're under stress. And so and since they're not analyzing and strategizing, trying to prepare for the worst case scenario in their future based on their fearful memories of the past, they have the opportunity to become present, to exist only in the now. So wouldn't it be a wonderful, you know, during a meditation to disconnect your association to all the elements in your outer environment, to get beyond your body, your fears, your schedule, forget about your familiar past and your predictable future. If you do it right, you will even lose track of time as you become and as you overcome your automatic thinking, your emotions and your habits in meditation, that is exactly what happens. You get beyond your body, your environment and time. You weaken the energetic bonds with your present, with your past present reality and find yourself in the present moment. Only in the present moment can you call your energy back to you. This does take some effort, although it will get easier with practice because you're living by the hormones of stress most of the time. So let's look at what happens when you aren't in the present moment during meditation so you'll know how to handle it when that arises. So understanding this skill is important because if you can't get beyond your stresses, your problems, and your pain, and you can't create a new future where those things don't exist. So let's say you're sitting in your meditation and you start to have some stray thoughts. You're in the habit of thinking that way because you've been thinking the same way and putting your attention on the same people and things at the same time and place for years now. And you have been automatically embracing the same familiar feelings on a daily basis just to reaffirm the same personality that's connected to your same personal reality, repeatedly conditioning your body into the past. The only difference now is that because you're trying to meditate, your eyes are shut. So as you're sitting there with your eyes closed, you are not physically seeing your boss, but your body wants to feel that anger because every time you see her in your waking day, 50 times a day, five days a week, you are in the habit of feeling bitterness or aggression. Similarly, when you get emails from her, which happens at least 10 times a day, you unconsciously have the same emotional reaction to her. So your body has grown accustomed to needing her to reaffirm your addiction to anger. It wants to feel the emotions it has become addicted to. And like an addict craving a drug, 
The body is craving the familiar chemicals. It wants to feel that familiar anger at your boss because you didn't get that promotion or it wants to feel judgment about your coworker who always wants you to cover for him. Then you start thinking about other colleagues who annoy you and other reasons to be upset with your boss. You're sitting there trying to meditate, but your body is throwing the kitchen sink at you. That's because it wants its chemical fix of familiar emotions that you normally feel throughout your waking day with your eyes open. The instant you notice what's happening, that you are putting all your attention on that emotion, you become aware that you're investing your energy into the past because emotions are the records of the past. So you stop and return to the present moment and you begin to disinvest your attention and energy out of the past. But then in a little while, you start to feel frustrated and angry again. And you realize what you're doing. You remember that your body is trying to feel those emotions in order to reaffirm its addiction to those chemicals. And you remember that those emotions drive your brain into a high range beta brain waves and you stop. Every time you pause, settle your body down and return to the present moment, you are telling your body that it is no longer the mind. You are the mind. I'm going to stop here. I like to tell my brain and I like to tell my ego that my focused awareness that I am the master and it is my servant. It must do as I say, just like my computer is my servant. It does what I program it to do, what I type into it. It must respond. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. So that's how I treat my brain. So moving on. But then thoughts start drifting into your mind about the people you have to see and the places you have to go and the things you have to do later that day. You wonder if your boss has answered that email yet. And you remember that you haven't returned your sister's phone call either. And today is a trash day. So you remind yourself you need to put out the trash. All of a sudden you become aware that by anticipating those future scenarios, you are investing your attention and your energy into the same known reality. So you stop, return to the present moment, and once more disinvest your energy out of that predictable known future and make room for the unknown in your life. So take a look at figure 2.8. It shows that once you find yourself in that sweet spot, of the generous present moment, your energy represented by the arrows no longer goes away from you to the past future, the way it did back in figure 2.3. Now you're going to be divesting your energy from the familiar past and predictable future. You are no longer firing and wiring the same circuits in the old way, and you are no longer regulating and signaling the same genes in the same way by feeling the same emotions. If you keep doing this process, you are continuously calling all that energy back to you by breaking the energetic bonds that keep you connected to your past, present reality. This happens because you're taking your attention and your energy off your outer world and placing it instead in your inner world. And you're building your own electromagnetic field surrounding your body. Now you have available energy that you can use to create something new. As you take your attention off your past environment and your past present reality or your predictable future reality, you are calling energy back to you and building your own electromagnetic field. So now that you have available energy to heal yourself or to create a new experience in your life. So not surprisingly, your attention eventually begins to wander again. As you continue to sit, in meditation, your body becomes more annoyed and impatient because it wants to do something. After all, you programmed it every day to get up and follow the same routine. It wants to quit meditating, open its eyes to see someone. It wants to hear something on TV or talk to someone on the phone. It prefers to taste breakfast instead of sitting there doing nothing. It would like to smell coffee brewing like it does every morning. And it would love to feel something like a hot shower before it starts the day. The body wants to experience physical reality with its senses in order to embrace an emotion. 
but your goal is to create a reality from a world beyond your senses that's defined not by your body as the mind, but as you as the mind. So as you become aware of the program, you keep settling your body down into the present moment. The body tries again to return to the familiar past because it wants to engage in a predictable future, but you keep settling it back down. Each time you overcome those automatic habits, your will becomes greater than your program. Every time you keep settling your body back to the present moment, like training a dog to sit, you are conditioning your body to a new mind. Each time you become aware of your program and you labor for the present moment, you are stating that your will is greater than your program. And if you keep returning your attention and therefore your energy back to the present moment, and you keep noticing when you are present and when you are not, sooner or later your body is going to surrender. It is this process of continuously returning to the present moment every time you become aware that you're, you've lost it that begins to break the energetic bonds with your familiar known reality. And when you do return to the present moment, what you're actually doing is getting beyond your physical world identity and unfolding into the quantum field. It's a concept I will explain in detail in the next chapter. The hardest part of every war is the last battle. That means that when your body as the mind is raging, causing you to think that you cannot go any further, wanting you to stop and return to the world of the senses, you keep persevering. You truly step into the unknown and sooner or later you will begin to break the emotional addiction within you. When you get beyond your guilt, your suffering, your fear, your frustration, your resentment, or your unworthiness, you are freeing your body from the chains of those habits and emotions that keep you anchored in the past. And as a result, you're liberating energy that is now coming back to you. As the body releases all of this stored emotional energy, it is no longer becoming the mind. You discovered that right on the other side of your fear is courage. Right on the other side of your lack is wholeness. And just beyond your doubt is knowing. When you step into the unknown and surrender your anger or hatred, you discover love and compassion. It's the same energy. It has just been stored in the body and now it's available for you to use to design a new destiny. And so when you learn to overcome yourself or the memory of yourself and your life, you break the bonds you have with everything, every person, every place, every time that's keeping you connected to the past present reality. And when you finally overcome your anger and your frustration and you liberate energy that was trapped in the past, you call that energy back to you. As you liberate all of that creative energy that has been tied up in those survival emotions within you and all around you, you are building your own personal energy field around your body. In our advanced workshops, we've actually measured, measured this effect of calling the energy back. We have experts who use this very sensitive equipment called a gas discharge visualization GDV machine with a, specific, with a specially designed sensor called a Sputnik antenna developed by Konstantin Korotko, PhD. He measures the ambient electromagnetic field in the workshop conference spaces to see how the energy changes as the workshop progresses. On the first full day of some of our advanced workshops, we sometimes see the energy in the room drop. That's because once we start meditating and those students have to overcome themselves by breaking the energetic bonds with everyone and everything in their known reality, they are calling back energy to themselves. They're drawing energy from the greater field and the field in the room can diminish as the participants begin to build their individual field of energy around their own bodies. And now they have available energy to use to design a new destiny. Of course, as the entire group gets beyond themselves the first day, they finally build their own light field. And as their energy keeps expanding each day, they begin to contribute to the energy in the room. 
As a result, we finally witnessed the energy in the room rise. To see what this sometimes looks like, find graphics 1A and 1B in the color insert. So I'll let you guys pull that up on your own books. One way to increase your chances of a successful meditation is to give yourself enough time so you don't get distracted by trying to rush through the experience. When I meditate, for example, I allow for two hours. I don't have to take two hours every time, but I know myself well enough by now to realize that if I have only one hour, I'm going to tell myself there's not enough time. But if I have two hours, on the other hand, I can relax knowing I have plenty of time to find the present moments. Some days I find the sweet spot of the present moment pretty quickly, while other days I have to work for an hour, bringing my brain and body back into the present moment. I'm a very busy person. And some days when I have just arrived home for three days between workshops or events, I wake up in the morning and I immediately think of three meetings I have planned for that day with different staff members mentally rehearsing what I have to talk about. Then I think about the emails I have to get done before I go to those meetings. Then I think about the flight I have to catch that afternoon. Then I make a mental note about the phone calls I have to make on the drive to the airport. You get the idea. As that happens, and I'm thinking about the same people I have to see, the same places I have to go, the same things I have to do, all at the same time in my known familiar reality, I realize that I'm priming my brain and body to look like that future has already happened. I become conscious that my, my attention is in the known future, and I stop anticipating the known and turn back to the present moment. So as I do that, I'm beginning to unfire and unwire those neural connections. So then I might get a little emotional and become impatient and a little frustrated thinking about something that happened yesterday. And since emotions are a record of the past and where I place my attention is where I place my energy, I become aware that I'm investing my energy in the past. Then the hormones of stress may get my brain aroused and my body gets a bit fired up into high beta, high range beta brain waves. And I have to sell it back down into the present moment again. And as I do that, I'm no longer firing and wiring the same circuits in my brain and I'm disinvesting my energy out of the past. So, and if I am aware of the same thoughts that are connected to those same familiar feelings, when I stop myself from feeling the same way, I'm no longer conditioning my body into the past and I'm no longer signaling the same genes in the same ways. And if emotions are the end products of experiences in the environment, and if it's the environment that signals the gene, then when I stop feeling those same emotions, I'm no longer selecting and instructing the same genes in the same ways. That only affects the health of my body, but it also no longer primes my body to be in the same future based on living in the past. So as I inhibit those familiar feelings, I am changing the genetic programming of my body. And since the hormones of long-term stress downregulate the expression of healthy genes and create disease every time I am able to stop when I catch myself feeling any of those emotions that are related to stress. I am no longer conditioning my body to stay addicted to the emotions of stress. So when you are in the sweet spot of the generous present moment, your familiar past and your predictable future no longer exist and now you are ready to create new possibilities in your life. If I do it properly, overcoming my familiar thoughts and emotions of my known past and future, then energetically, neurologically, biologically, chemically, hormonally, and genetically, that predictable future, as well as the familiar past I use to affirm it, no longer exists. If I'm no longer firing and no longer wiring those same old neural networks by no longer thinking about those memories of the people or things at certain times and places, and I keep returning to the present moment, I am calling energy back to me. Take a look at figure two point now, and you can see how the familiar past and the predictable future no longer exist. Now I'm in the sweet spot of the generous present moment. And I have available energy to create. I've built my own energy field surrounding my body. 
Every time I labored, sometimes for hours, to get beyond myself and find that place called the eternal now, and I truly break through, I've always thought the same thing. That was so worth it. And that ends chapter two. Any thoughts, Jennifer? Great reminders. Yeah, and it's funny, I, this is my third reading of this book and I didn't quite catch the first two times how much Dr. Joe still struggles and in his meditations where he says sometimes he's able to you know start meditation and boom he's right there in quantum and other times it takes him an hour of battling it's like thinking about the meetings the people the places the things you know all these different circumstances he he may battle for up to an hour before he can get into that place where he's in that quantum where he is able to create his reality and um i mean that's showing us we all have to have grace for ourselves and it's okay. It's okay to have the thoughts, to have the feelings. The thing is recognize them and then you are the focused awareness and you've chosen to use your mind to now control your ego, put your ego away and be the master of your brain and say, okay, brain, these are the thoughts. I don't want to think about these thoughts now. Be quiet. And oh, these are the feelings that I'm having come up in my body. Resentment, anger, frustration, sadness, whatever. Nervousness, panic attack. Brain, do as I say. No, I'm calling in all of my energy because I'm going to create my new personal reality. I'm going to create my future. I'm, I'm, my future is going, I'm going to put the order in. So this is what we're doing. I need all of my energy. I need to have laser-like focus in order to do this. So you slow down your heart rate, you slow down your breath, you slow down your brain waves, you get into that theta state, you get into heart and brain coherence so that you can get to that door where now you can go into that 5D realm where now you're molding the clay like Abraham Hicks, you know, talks about in all of her different discourses. And now those potential waveforms of energy as you put your focus and attention on them and you focus on what it is that you do want, guess what? They turn into particles. One particle, two particle, three particle, four. Before you know it, you have a whole bunch more. And now that can pop into your 3D experience because it coalesces and now it can become a reality. And then you let it go. You don't know when it's going to happen but you can walk around with excitement knowing it's like, oh my gosh, I put my order in. I know it's gonna happen. I don't know when, that's the surprise. How it's gonna show, I don't know. Where it's gonna show, I don't know, but I know it's gonna show up somewhere. And that's fun and exciting. It's like every time we do meditation, we basically have this huge treasure box with all these goodies that we put in there. And you're gonna have someone who's gonna gift wrap them and surprise you with them at the most unexpected time. So you got a lot of goodies in there. You got a lot of really cool surprises in queue. To me, that's like, how fun is that? That's yeah. really fun. I love that. Yeah. And so that's the work that we're doing. So I want to thank you, Jennifer, for that lovely bowl, um, singing bowls. And uh, I would love to, can you do just a few more minutes of that so that we can finish this with some of the singing bowl music? Yeah, sure, it's my pleasure.
Wow, that was beautiful. That's a D bowl, so that is the same as the frequency of the second center. Mm. Yeah, that felt that felt really wonderful. Kind of had a sense that you, that um, during the middle of that singing bowl, I kind of felt like other dimensional beings kind of they were called in. Oh yeah. I could I could feel that. I was like, whoa, I didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah, I can feel the frequency change a lot of times when I play them. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. What a wonderful treat for our viewers. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so good night, or maybe I should be saying good morning because I know we started at 11. Yeah, it's 2 a.m., so thank you for tuning in, tapping in, and turning on. And we concluded chapter two, and next we'll be doing chapter three. All right. Ciao for now. Peace and love always. Blessings. Thanks, Lillian. Blessings to you, too.